Simpson Committee. Agenda item one is apologies. Clark, it is my understanding that uh, apologies have been received from Nicola Brogan, Harry Harvey, and Robbie Butler, MLA, correct? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then agenda item two is chairperson business. Uh, 2.1 is the Hansard record of the Northern Ireland Humanists evidence on the 21st of October. Can I refer members to the Hansard for the committee evidence session with the Northern Ireland Humanists on Thursday, 21st of October at page five? Uh, the committee um, did not have quorum shortly after the briefing began uh, and the briefing was taken by the remaining members on, informally. Uh, can I seek members' agreement that the Hansard be included in the report of the committee stage of the Integrated Education Bill to ensure there is a full record of that presentation? Agreed? Agreed, members? Agreed, no. Chair. Agreed. Thanks very much. Okay, then. Uh, agenda item three, then, is draft minutes. Um, can I actually, before we go to draft minutes, um, Clark, I'm not sure if we've had any further correspondence in relation to uh, special school staff shortages. Um, if that isn't on another agenda item, would it be possible for the committee to agree to write to the Minister for Education to seek an update in relation to reports we have received about sh uh, shortages in special school staff? Uh, availability and to ask what actions being taken to respond to that challenge. Yes, Chair. I haven't seen any correspondence about that now coming through my inbox. Okay. Members content to agree just to write to seek a, an update on, on that matter? Agree? Thank you. Okay, then, members, uh, agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 21st of October? at page 13 of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed, thank you. Okay, members, there are no matters arising. So agenda item five is correspondence. Can I refer members to page 19, where we have 10 items of correspondence and the summary notes included at page 20. Clark. You like to speak to the correspondence, please? Yes, Chair. Um, item 5 to members on page 23 is correspondence from the Minister of Education informing the committee that she has advised the Department for Health and Social Care in England that she wishes to expire Section 37 and the relevant part of Schedule 16 of the Coronavirus Act 2020. This is the section that gives the Department powers uh, relating to the temporary closure of schools um, on a on a mandatory basis and they haven't been used in here in the department's response on the pandemic. Uh, so members have you got any views on that letter? Members content to note. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chair item 53 on page 24 is a response from the department regarding the committee's concerns over the department not collecting information on individual students' access to an appropriate electronic device. Um, DE has in indicated that the relevant data is collected at school level. Um, so perhaps we could take that up with the uh, budget officials um, this morning. You know, about it's, they're going to be talking about how much money has been secured um, for laptops, teachers, and pupils. Um, and you might get some population data there. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems important that the Department of Education would understand, <clears throat> um, ha have an understanding of, of how many pupils um, do and do not have access to digital devices and Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, ha have the, the correspondence states that they don't have access to the data. Does it say anything about any attempts being made to, to access the data? Um, no, I think that, you know, the fact that it's at, at school level, um, well, that, that to me infers, but I can check, um, you know, whether that is being collated by the department um, or the EA. Yeah, I think members can tend to 
Yeah, members can attempt to respond to the Department of Education to ask if they intend to make any attempts to um, to understand the amount of pupils that do and do not have access to digital devices. Agreed. It's, sorry, am, am I reading this correctly? Does sorry. Go ahead, Diane. I'm sorry. Um, I mean, the letter does say that the department is aware of the number of devices required. Um, the details of the pupils um, and and so on was managed by the school. Is 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 there an issue with what is the issue with with that level of data for the for the committee? What is the issue? I mean, surely it is the school. The school leader is best placed to know, and and the teachers who needs the the devices. Yeah, surely that. <laughs> My, my, no, no intention of creating a, a major issue here. It, it, the, the, <coughs> the query is, do we have a, an understanding of how many pupils in Northern Ireland have access to, adequate access to a digital device and Wi-Fi connectivity? And do we have an understanding of those who don't? The, the text referring to the department being aware of the number of devices required, my understanding is it refers to the the number of applications to the digital devices loan scheme. I don't I don't know if if we are to be content that we correlate the number of applications to the digital devices loan scheme as the number of people in Northern Ireland who do not have digital devices. I don't. I don't know. Um, if that if that's what they're saying, that's what they're taking, and they don't have any way or intention of of being clearer than that. Then that's that's fair enough. Um, we we may or, well, we may. Or I mean, Chris, this, this, this isn't the big issue for me. I'm just. There are so many big issues in education that I'm. I'm I, I was assuming that um, school teachers and leaders. Um, had had prioritised and and given thought to who who most required, um, and that that's the way the need was fulfilled. I mean, I'm happy. It doesn't really. It's not a big issue. It's really not. Okay. Um, well, I mean, the 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 digital devices loan scheme ensured twenty five thousand devices were allocated to those children most in need. So I don't I don't know if most in need mean I don't know if that includes everyone who. Who didn't have a device? I don't know. I'm just not entirely clear. And I, I think from the engagement that we did during the pandemic, there was a, a, a growing consensus that digital equality was key to equal opportunity in education. Um, maybe, maybe we can, maybe individually, we can reflect on on the correspondence a bit more and see if there are any individual follow up questions. But um, I, I would be keen just to know if. If the department is taking the applications to the digital devices loan loan scheme as a as a proxy for how for the unmet need, um, and and if that is an adequate proxy for unmet need, I guess that's what I'm saying. Anyone else want to come in or content to note for now? Okay, Clark. Yeah, we'll move on. Sure. yeah thanks, thanks, Pat. We'll move on to the next card form. Thanks, Clark. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, there are other items in in the folder as well. Um, there's the correspondence from DE um, regarding the joint oral briefing um, from DE and Economy, um, and the committee has already written on that. Um, DE also advises uh, at page at item five five that the review of education of the education authority. Um, will be carried out by Baker Tilly Mooney Moor. Um, item 5.6 on page 30 is correspondence from Cara Hunter MLA requesting that the committee consider a visit on briefing or briefing on Gail Colostia Dura, an Irish medium school in Dungiven. Um, so members, um, would you like to add that to um, the list of places that we might visit? Yeah, um, can, I, can, I, can I just take us back to five point four as you you referenced, um, which is corresponds from the Department of Education on the cancellation of the scheduled oral briefing on the fourteen to nineteen strategy. 
Um, so obviously the Department of Education and the Department of Economy cancelled their briefing, their joint briefing to the Joint Education and Economy Committees on the 14th and 19th strategy. Um, so we obviously wrote to them to ask for an explanation, um, particularly given we received 24 hours notice and, and as a result couldn't reschedule other business. Um, the, the response, uh, the extent of the response is that we are aware uh, the committee. The committee will be aware of the Education and Economy Committee's joint oral briefing um, did not proceed as planned. Yeah, um, that's the way that we received it actually on the morning of last week's Wednesday meeting. Okay. And I, Wednesday meeting, sorry, and I read it into the record. So, okay. yeah, so that they haven't replied to the subsequent question yet. Okay, for further explanation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, if you can keep us posted in relation to that, then um, I, I, I'm at a bit of a loss as to why we couldn't get a, a briefing on an update, um, even without the strategy. So, okay, we'll keep we'll keep a, an eye on that then, Avian. Um, yes, could I? Could, Pat, could, Pat, Pat, yeah, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, just comment on that issue that Avian raised there about Gail College Jagara. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, because I was actually up visiting uh, that school a couple of weeks ago, and there's some very exciting things happening there, and they have received commitments for funding uh, from the department. However, it, it, it's it's an excellent case study, I believe, uh, in how the department doesn't uh, act strategically. Um, the enrolment figures for that school are well in excess of what was expected by the department. And their own projections for the next few years uh, are, 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 are telling them that whatever provision is being made now for the school is, is going to be uh, extremely limiting for the school uh, within the next three, four, five years. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a case study for the committee to look at how there is a lack of strategic planning, uh, particularly in around the Irish medium. So I think it would be useful for us to, to visit that school at some time. Obviously, there, there are difficulties in terms of fitting it into the forward work programme, but I think it would be worth doing if we can. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, content to add that to the, the list of suggested um, venues and maybe for us to get a, a, an agenda item where we... We, we start looking at the board work program, the see if we can program um, a visiting content for that to be added. Pat, that members content for that to be added to the list. Agree. Okay. Um, Clark, you, you referred to item five point five there as well, which isn't insignificant. That's a, a a review of the education authority. Um, yeah. Uh, yep, and the. Um, as you mentioned, Baker Tilly Mooney Moore has been selected um, as the candidate for the review. The review will commence in November now, with the review being completed and reported on in spring 2022. Uh, that, uh, obviously, uh, significant. That's a, that's a full, comprehensive review of the Education Authority, Clark, yeah? Yes, Chair. Okay. Um, yeah. will, will, will we be getting any briefing in terms of the terms of reference for that review? Is it is it worth us maybe writing to request that? Um, we can certainly write and, and request additional information. Okay, yeah. that'd, be, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Any other correspondence there? Um, sorry, Chair, how will the committee in, in, interact with that review? I'm not presently aware, Diane. I think that, that would be interesting um, for us to know. Well, yeah. it would be because I'm sure I'm sure that committee members have quite. I have very strong views on the education authority and the run-ins I've had with them over the past number of weeks and months. Um, but I'm just wondering how, how the committee. I think we should give consideration as to how we interact with that. Okay. I agree. And actually, to be fair, the correspondent says the education committee will be invited to participate in the review, and I will write to you to make the necessary arrangements in due course, so we can we can make sure that yeah. gets programmed into work. Yeah. Yeah, it does actually. It does actually give an overview. I mean, um, 
we will seek to consider the overall options and governance of the EA and the extent to which it's effectively able to deliver against stated priorities. Um, and then, yes, as you say, um, the education will be invited. Education committee will be invited to participate. Um, so yeah, that might be all that there is at the moment. But it's just something that we should be aware of for the future work plan. That yeah. that's the that's the only point I'm making. I think there's agreement on that, Diane. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thanks. Um, can I can I just raise a, a, in the same vein? I mean, in terms of this work by Tilly Baker Mooney, for for us as a committee, it couldn't have come at a worse time in terms of where we are in the mandate. But in terms of the uh, remit that Tiller, Becky, Mooney, Moore have, is it uh, possible that uh, A, we could have a, a look at that remit, and B, is it possible to ask them how they might intend to uh, allow the committee to participate in the review? And even if it's only outlines of both of those, Chair, it would be helpful in us trying to plan forward. Yeah, that seems sensible. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, just to refer briefly to the correspondence again, states that the review will seek to consider um, the overall operations and governance of the EA and the extent to which it is effectively able to deliver against priorities. It will examine the extent to which the organisation is well governed and observes high standards of transparency and efficiency. So, yeah, we can follow up on all those uh, sensible suggestions. Okay. Uh, Clark, I know item 5.8 as well is uh, correspondence uh, from in relation to concerns raised by 57 teachers in the uh, with regards to worrying trends in the study of Irish language and other language in English medium post primary schools. Um, can we forward that correspondence to the minister for a response? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And any other correspondence you need to raise there? No. No, Chair. Okay. Um, other no than that on the index, yeah. No problem. Okay, members content to uh, agree the correspondence then, agree? Yep. Members can just give me a, a, an audible agreed for record, that would be great. Can you hear me okay? It's yeah. Very quiet. Am I, you can hear me okay, Clark, yeah. Great, Chair. Oh, that's great, thank you. Okay, then members agenda item six is forward work program. Can I refer members to the draft forward work program and tabled papers? Uh, Clark, do you want to speak to the forward work program? Yeah, um, Chair, the the forward work program represents the scheduling of um, the integrated education uh, committee stage um, and as well as that uh, other headline um, items that the committee has wanted to prioritise. You can see that it is getting quite full. The committee was um, anxious to speak to um, youth uh, uh, representatives about the bill um, and the youth forum and the Nikki youth panel um, would like to come. But during school hours, that is awkward. So I was hoping that members might be able to attend um, a 5 p.m. Uh, meeting with them, perhaps on a Thursday. Um, so I'll follow up with members afterwards about their availability over the next couple of weeks at that time. Um, yeah, so that's the main thing on, on Forward Work Programme. Okay. Members content to agree the Forward Work Programme as amended? Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, then that moves us to agenda item seven, which is our briefing from the Department of Education on the October monitoring round, budget and stroll campus. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a Department of Education briefing paper on October monitoring on page 129 and a Department of Education briefing paper on the Stroll campus in table papers and a clerk's brief uh, and areas of consideration in tabled papers? Can I welcome 
Gary Fair, Director of Finance from the Department of Education, Stephen Van Houten, Deputy Finance Director, Seamus Gallagher, Active Investment and Infrastructure Director, Sinead Crossan, Stroll Shared Education Campus Business Change Manager, and Jennifer Morgan, Stroll Shared Education Campus Construction Director. You're all very welcome to the Education Committee today. Thanks very much for giving us your time. Can, I will be able to give you up to 10 minutes to make an opening statement and then followed by questions from members. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, thank you. Can I just check? You can hear us okay? We can. You, that's yep. some, of the, some of the best audio quality we've had, Gary. That's a good start. <laughs> as long as you can hear us. Um, we're sort of spread across the room here, so if you need us to move the speaker at any point as we change whoever's speaking, we can do that. Thank you very much for inviting us along. Um, we can just see yourself now at the moment, but I'm sure that the videos will be corrected shortly. I presume you can see us. We, we, so, we can. And I think yeah. all, even if you can only see me, all the, the members uh, yeah. can hear you. Apologies, it's only yeah. me you're being subjected to, Gar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was just going to give a, a brief outline of our October monitoring bids, both on the resource and capital side, the outcome of October monitoring, and then I presume you, you might, might want to open up to any questions after I've done that in terms of October monitoring itself before you move on to the other areas, if you're content. Sounds good, yep. Adopt that approach? Yep. So I'm just referring to the paper that we shared with the committee. Um, just updating and as required and as we're very happy to do, just updating you on the October monitoring position and the bids that were submitted by the department. So uh, just to give context, uh, we, we sort of outlined the position that we were left with at the end after June monitoring, where we had identified pressures of 178.9 million at June monitoring, of which 76.4 were bid for. So I'm not going to run through all of the detail there, but we did get, we managed to secure additional resources. If you recall, at the very start of the year, the department was overcommitted, and we were reliant on getting uh, roughly 81 million from the centre, and we did secure all of that fairly quickly into the new financial year. So then at June monitoring, we submitted 76.4 million of bids. Of these, 35.7 million was allocated to DE. 8% and the SEN funding for schools, uh, particularly the SEN coordinators, and also 27.7 million to address other SEN pressures. So SEN is obviously one of the biggest impacts on the Education Authority's block grant, probably eating in about 50% of it, and it's an increasing demand service. Uh, as you know, the Education Authority is looking at all that side of things, but it's a big pressure. It's always a big financial pressure. We generally do have success in year in securing additional resources. Uh, in addition, there was a, a separate, there, there were COVID bids submitted to 40.1 million at June monitoring. Uh, we only got 3.3 million in relation to those particular bids. Uh, there were 18 million of capital bids met, 14 million for mining works and 4 million for the EA ICT program. They were funded at, at uh, June monitoring and then there was a further capital funding of 19 million was provided in respect to the COVID-19 related expenditure and the provision of laptops to teachers. So table two, I'm not going to go through it all, but table two sort of gives the detail of where we, where we stood, the June monitoring pressures that were identified, the funding that was allocated, the, some funding that was met internally out of the Minister's contingency, and then the residual unfunded pressures at that point in time. So with every new monitoring round, we obviously review, there's the, the position as was at the end of the last, the previous monitoring round, we then review that we go around all of the directorates and the various arm's length bodies just to review where the, you know, where the bids sit at that point in time. So uh, let's say teaching pressures, there, there continued to be some pressures on various pay fronts. Teaching pay awards, uh, the pressure every year really for the teachers pay awards for the 19 and 20 pay settlement is, is 44 million. Now it was originally estimated that there would be savings of about 12 million, but in reality it's, it's gonna take longer for those savings to be delivered. So we, we therefore 
you know, the residual pressure that we needed to bid for was therefore nine million, and we bid for that. There's the contractual increment, teaching pay work contractual cost of 3.8 million, which was the residual amount that we needed to bid for. And then there's the teaching pay award for this year, 2021. That was identified as a pressure of 11 million. We didn't bid for that at June monitoring and it has been held. We haven't bid for it in this monitoring round either because negotiations are still ongoing with the teaching unions. So it's early days and the principle that ministers have adopted over the last few years is not to bid until uh, a pay agreement has, has been, you got to the point of agreement. Non-teaching pay pressures, there are still some outstanding pressures there. Uh, the, the overall estimated pressure has increased. It's always a bit unclear at the start of the year exactly what it will look like. Uh, and it's actually estimated to be higher than what was originally antici anticipated. So we bid for 7.7 .7 million October monitoring round. Again, these are real pressures that come through. They're nationally negotiated, which we don't have any local say over, really. And then SEN pressures were a bit further. Uh, I've, I've outlined the detail in that paragraph there. I'll not go through it all again. It's, 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 the same pressures are kept under constant review as the year goes on. We engage closely with the Education Authority and bid, bid as required. So pressure of 19.9 million was supported for SEM. Resourcing pressures in school is essential. It was essentially identified as an NDNA pressure. The amount that was required, the shortfall, if you like, at school spend level. Uh, we haven't done anything about that at this point in the year because really the Education Authority doesn't have a clear view on school spend probably until this month, later this month. Uh, and this, this is the kind of mismatch that we face in terms of the financial year and the school calendar year. So. We're holding off on that to see where school spend sits. And again, it could be a situation this year where the additional money that has gone in for COVID related issues will have a beneficial impact on school budgets generally, as it did last year. The Education Authority has identified, identified block grant pressures of 42.1 million. Now, if you jump to table three in the document, it actually uh, summarizes, and uh, when you take send pressures and pay, pay pressures out, it leaves pressures of about 11 million, which were bid for. And you can see the various headings there in that table that make up that pressure. Again, this is something that's kept under review as the year goes on. We, we engage closely with the Education Authority. Uh, it's not always clear from their point of view either exactly where some of these pressures will land as the year proceeds. But we were certainly content to support bids of 11 million at October monitoring. School maintenance pressure has actually, it was bid for at June monitoring, wasn't met. So we, we bid again, now it was revised downwards. It was, it was at, it's now estimated that only about 7.3 million can be spent this year. So that was bid for. And then teaching and non-teaching redundancies. As you know, there's no kind of centrally funded voluntary exit scheme for departments to access this year. And in the past it was done through RRI borrowing. The decision was taken by the finance minister not to go down that route this year. So all we are seeking again is sort of the minimal amount that is required linked to school amalgamation, school closures, etc., and also SEM related. And then there were some additional pressures identified at this monitoring round. We have been engaging with the Education Authority over recent months, just reviewing the funding of dual sites and in year growth, because it, is, it has been a problem area that has been drawn to the Education Authority and our attention, uh, where, where schools do feel that they have been shortchanged in some ways in the past. So we've done quite a substantial review of that. Still not quite clear this year what the pressure will look like. The Education Authority came through with a higher figure than we felt we could stand over, but we, we did bid for an, el an element for that pressure. The yeah, block grants pressures I've covered. And then there were a number of other smaller uh, inescapable and high priority pressures that made up a total of about 0.8 million. So table five summarizes the, the pressures really that were identified, 75.42 million. As you'll see from that table, some of them the minister was able to meet out of the contingency fund. 
And the total in uh, table six, it shows the total that we actually bid to the Department of Finance for 61.9 million. And you can see the areas that I've already covered there that we focused on. You see the proposed priority order. In reality, as all of these are inescapable pressures and will impact on the overall, our overall budget come the, the end of the year if they're not funded. In a sense, they're all of equal priority, but we are required when we're submitting bids to, have, to give a priority order, uh, which probably explains why we were successful mainly on the sand front. The Minister's contingency budget just summarised the position there where we've got to. We started out, the Minister had kept aside about 9 million, uh, and then decisions were made at October monitoring of, of some smaller pressures that could be met out of the contingency fund. The VES pressures we bid for as well because those have always been met by the centre in the past. So we felt it was appropriate to bid for them, but it was still uh, an urgent pressure that needed to be addressed. So in the short term, at least, that was met out of the contingency budget. So you'll see that there's still about five million being proposed to be held back. That, I suppose, is largely reflects that it, that it was unclear exactly how much we would get out of October monitoring. So it was a precautionary approach. It's always prudent for some money to be held back. There were also some reduced requirements as summarized in paragraphs 40 to 43. And there were there are also some ring fenced amounts that had to be surrendered. Obviously, if money is allocated to us from the center in a ring fenced way, and I'm referring entirely, I think, to COVID-19 funds there, where most of them were allocated for very specific purposes, those have to be declared as and surrendered. Uh, unless we can make the case that within a more general heading we can move the resources around and use them for an alternative purpose which is summarized there in paragraph 46 where we were able to do that uh, in relation to the well-being and pastoral support recovery program we made the case that uh, it could be used for you know the, the similar intention there was no money at the centre this monitoring round for depreciation and impairment pressures. So we bid for certain amounts, but nothing was allocated. There were also a couple of reclassifications. Uh, funding of one million was previously secured to enable youth providers without sufficient IT access to deliver service to support young people and to ensure that those young people most vulnerable or at risk can access online youth services. So a request was made to reclassify one million from resource to capital for this purpose. And uh, further to the reduced, yes, the, the, I was making reference to us being able to move them some ring fenced funding, small amount of ring fenced funding. So there was a reduced requirement noted in paragraph 46, the additional educational needs team had also requested to reclassify 0.8 of its COVID-19 EA behavior support budget from resource to capital. So, um, moving on then to capital. Gary, is, it worth, is it worth us maybe breaking this into resource and capital yeah, on, that's on, the, on the grounds yeah, that fine. members um, keep their questions concise? Okay, yeah. so members. Um, maybe, maybe if I can just close off the resource element by indicating yeah. what, we actually, what we actually got then. On okay. The resource yeah. So, the, the outcome of October monitoring is that uh, 9.2 million has been allocated to the to DE. 5.8 is to support special education needs, uh, which includes additional educational needs, SEND transport, and temporary specialist support, and 1 million for asymmetric testing in special schools, one point, uh, and 1.7 million has been allocated for schools pressures, including PPE, and 0.7 for, uh, million for substitute cover, largely linked to absences as a result of COVID. And I'll leave the capital in, as you suggest. Yeah, I th if there's obviously quite a bit of info to get through there, Gary, so I yeah. appreciate that. But if, if members will um, take, if, if Assembly Broadcasting could bring members into the spotlight for a question and members could just um, understand that we will also turn to capital, we'll also turn to Strudel um, as well. So this is not your only bite of the cherry to ask question members. If we could keep it concise, that would be helpful. Gary, I'll, I'll start us off then. Um, I'm just keen to kind of cross-reference um, the bids with the allocations in October monitoring round. So 
um, there was an application for, well, that's capital, um, asymptomatic testing in schools. The bid was one million. The allocation was one million. So that's good news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and that's uh, that's for twice weekly lateral flu test supply. Yes, I should have said the outset there was no distinction distinction uh, in the bids between uh, COVID related and non COVID related. We just they were all lumped in together. So as you see from table six, I'm assuming that the table numbers are the same in your paper. Uh, yeah. We we identified special education needs as priority one. So that yeah. table, that's so why. for members, yeah. table six is on our on page one three six of our pack members. I'll try and rattle through these reasonably quickly, um, Gary. You, yeah. I'll come back to CO two monitors during um, the capital presentation. Um, PPE for education authority services the bid was three point four million, and the allocation was not point four million. What what's the implication of 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 that significantly lower allocation than the bid? Uh, well, obviously the bid reflected what the identified need was estimated to be. The, the issue with all bids at a point in time during the course of the year is that there are estimates of where we think the costs are likely to land. So I suppose it, it, it would be wrapped up in where we see the school spend going to. There's no clear indication of that yet. Well, the Education Authority will have a clear idea of that later in this month, as I was saying. So I think it's a matter of saying it's it's the totality of all the funding that is making its way to schools that will make the difference and made a difference last year. So it's a bit early in the year to tell. Uh, if it's still identified as a need coming up to January monitoring, then we'll review the position and bid again if required. Okay. Okay. PP for special schools bid was not 0 0.7 and the award was not 0.4. Is that adequate to meet need? Again, we'll have to. It's a matter of waiting to see. You know, okay. it, at, at least it's better that we got a, a fair proportion of that particular bid. Okay. Schools based pressures, including PPE, the bid was 14.4 million. Yeah. And the allocation was 1.3 million mm -hmm. it's a significant gap what is what's the implications of that again really we need to wait and see how the school spend is looking this year we've read there has already been about 139 million resource put in related to COVID, COVID related issues into the system so that is likely hopefully to have a positive impact uh, Again, if, there's, if, it, if it's identified that there's still a pressure in that area, then we'll bid again at January monitoring. And you could see why we would be concerned about oh, yeah, the, absolutely. The, the, the gap in relation to that bid. That's a gap of £13 yeah. million. Pounds, so um, yeah. it would be good to get a bit more detail in, in regards to what, what the implications of, of that are. In, um, terms of, in terms of impact, it's, still, it's a bit early, but we, we'll probably have a better idea, as I say, later this month. Okay. The special, okay. Special schools substitute cover. The bid was not point nine, and the allocation was not point five. We raised this issue earlier. I had been contacted by um, people concerned about special school staff shortages. Um, is that in response to that issue? And is the allocation of um, not point five million adequate to meet that need? It'll certainly be helpful. I mean, ultimately, that pressure will land on the Education Authority and they'll have to pick that up somehow or other. So we would need to wait and see. It, it's obviously been a big issue. We're, we're all aware that it's been a big issue over recent weeks in terms of staff absences. So we'll, we'll have to keep it under review in conjunction with the Education Authority. OK, it's, it's gone as far as requiring some schools to close early. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, be, yes. be good to be kept up, date, up to date as to whether that's yes. adequate resource to respond to that concerning issue. Um, okay, um, I think uh, some of the other ones are more capital-based then, um, other than the pay award. So non-teaching pay award bid was £7.7 .7 million, and there was no allocation on that. Is that correct? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we didn't get anything for pay. No, nothing for pay in this monitoring round. 
and teaching pay award 2021 was 3.8 million teaching pay award 2019 and 2029 million none yeah. none of those bids boundary exit 3.1 none of those bids were met then no that's right although as i was saying in terms of the voluntary exit that's a it's a smaller amount and that has been initially met out of the minister's contingency but ideally we would continue to bid for that at january monitoring so the Department of Education in November 2021 has yet to meet the Teaching Pay Awards for 2019 and 2020, is that right? No, no, they have been met. It's just uh, still highlighted as a, as a potential pressure as the year proceeds because we don't have full cover for it. I mean, uh, uh, we've been trying to move away, as you know, in recent years and, and highlighting what the pay pressures are rather than there being an assumption that the whole sector will just absorb pay pressures which is one of the reasons why uh, we don't actually bid for resources to cover any new pay increase until a settlement has been agreed. So it is, it's still a, a concern and an issue to us that the pay pressures aren't baselined, aren't included as part of our opening baseline every year. Why, uh, why are they not baselined? Uh, just uh, because of the pressures on the block. We are told, obviously, I mean, we, the department has allocated a baseline. I, one of our issues every year is that we are having to argue the case to have certain things included in our baseline that aren't. For example, at the start of the, this year, we were living on a promise to some extent that we would get certain amounts, such as the confidence and supply money, focused on areas of deprivation, pay pressure, and, and uh, well, at the start of this year as well, some COVID pressures that were promised. So it, it is a bit of a concern and it's a, okay. a concern for future years as well. Okay. Uh, so you're, the total the total bid, um, the total resource October monitoring round bid was 84.3 million and the total allocation was 9.2 million. Well, we, we, we actually only submitted bids of 61.9 million because some elements of the pressures were met internally out okay. of the master's contingency. So, so 61.9 million bids, 9.2 million allocated. What, yeah. what, so, what's sorry, the indication of it? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. It's, it, the, the non-COVID bids were the 61.9. Uh, they're in table six. And then the um, the COVID the, the COVID bids that we submitted were uh, twenty two point three in Table Eleven, so the total of okay. the total resource bids put forward was seventy four point two. Just the bids to DOF, and then there's okay. The... Okay, so a, a significant amount, tens of millions of unmet bid. What what is the implication of that on the resource budget, Gary? Well, we are obviously very concerned because these are real pressures. We don't submit bids unless they've been robustly challenged by the department. And with, you know, there's, there's a confidence with our DOF supply colleagues that we, we won't submit bids unless we think they're serious bids. So it, it is a concern. Um, it's, a matter, it's a matter now really of waiting until the January monitoring round and seeing where, where these pressures lie at that point in time. And bidding again, that's obviously our last opportunity of the year. Okay, so you, you, uh, there's a distinct possibility come the end of the year that you won't be able to meet all your requirements? At this point in time, that would be our concern, yes. And how, how serious a problem is that? Well, it's, uh, the, the problem is, I suppose, at different points in the year, it can be difficult to see where things are going to land by the end of the year. Um, it's a matter of monitoring all of these pressures as the year proceeds and, a, and our only okay. other opportunity. Okay, keen to bring other members in on resource. If I, if I could ask you really, really, really quickly, um, your reduced requirements included a reduced requirement of, of 3.3 million in respect of SIA operational costs. It, mm -hmm. It's been put to me a couple of times. Um, uh, this was a result of the centre determined grades. So, um, in, in frank terms, and maybe you can respond to this, it's been put to me that if, if centres conducted that work rather than SIA, why didn't centres receive the resource to do it? Well, there wasn't any... Uh, I, I so, I sorry, wouldn't... can I... Can I um, well, actually, the um, C is, is declaring a reduced requirement for the, the fees that they would have taken in. 
but actually, uh, schools, post-primary schools, have have somewhat benefited um, from that decision because they're they're not paying any fees to the post-primary, sorry, to to SIA for the exams, and then actually the their budget, uh, their share of the aggregated schools budget hasn't been adjusted. So actually, in the last two years, because of COVID, uh, post-primary schools have actually benefited uh, from that. Okay, okay, can you bring other members in? Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Chain, MLA, please? Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks, Gary, for that presentation. And, and Chris has already highlighted the gap between the, the bids and the actual allocations. Yeah. But given the need to prioritise health, uh, it, it's welcome that £20 million pounds could be made available uh, to meet some pressures, particularly, particularly in relation to special educational needs. And it's positive, I suppose, that this was agreed by the entire executive. But the level of bids just goes to show you how chronically underfunded our education system has been. Uh, and particularly over the last 10 years, it's estimated that uh, up to £250 million in real terms has been uh, stripped out of our education system. But in any event, I want to uh, return to the issue of special educational needs uh, because it's an area that that does require a lot of extra funding and, and the finance minister was able to make some funding available. However, I'm reminded of the report from the audit office last year uh, that stated that despite uh, hundreds of millions of pounds going into the area of special educational needs, neither the department nor the education authority uh, were able to show value for money. Uh, what steps have been taken to address this and how can we be sure that children with special educational needs are getting the support that they deserve and are entitled to? Thanks. Uh, I, I wouldn't feel qualified to get into the detail of of that discussion. There is uh, there's a lot of thought being given to that. There's there's been a program of work being taken forward and uh, between the department and in conjunction with the education authority. So there is a lot of thought being given to it. A lot of work going on in the background at the moment. Uh, but I wouldn't be the the best person to give you an account of where that has got to. And then who's uh, the person who has lead responsibility for that within the department, Gary? Uh, it would probably be Ricky Urban. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I'll return to that at some stage with Ricky. But, uh, I mean, I think it is important that when officials are coming in to brief on budgetary issues, uh, in the light of that audit office report, uh, we should be able to uh, receive a briefing on that. However, I'll move on to another issue, and uh, I, I wondered, could officials give us some overview or a sense of what the outcome of the spending review will mean for the education department? And I, I appreciate that you may not be able to give any certainty around figures. Uh, can you explain the benefits of what uh, a three-year budget plan uh, would entail? Uh well, you're right. I can't actually comment in any detail at this because we haven't. We, uh, the Department of Finance is still working through crunching the numbers, I suppose, and depart, you know we'll have a better idea in, in the next. Well, hopefully in the next week or so. Um, there's there are definitely advantages in having a multi-year budget. It's something that all of us have been sort of crying out for for years. Uh, even if it's not great news, I think it's better that departments are aware of. So some so that there can be more effective planning. Now, as as uh, you pointed out at the start as well, I mean uh, the education sector has clearly been underfunded for quite a number of years now, and and there's this constant battle of trying to get sufficient into our baseline. So I mean, worst case scenario, if we're given a three-year budget that doesn't look good, then I suppose the challenges will be probably at a political level as much as anything else. Well, what can be taken forward and what can't be taken forward. Because, uh, you know, certainly we have identified significant pressures moving forward and we're waiting to see what the budget settlement might look like. But obviously there's, there is a big focus on health at the moment as well. And we'll just have to wait and see just how much we benefit. But it's certainly better to have, you know, 
a three-year budget as opposed to a one-year budget. It enables better planning. Okay, and I note that some financial support has been made available uh, in terms of the Fair Start report uh, for purchasing of laptops, and I suppose that's to be welcome. Uh, but can I ask for an update in relation to uh, the funding for the implementation of the Fair Start Action Plan? We heard in previous updates that uh, funding that was provided wasn't perhaps what was required. Uh, so can you advise if the three-year budget would be helpful in, in delivering a more sustainable funding package for that plan? I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah, In fact, it's essential because that this has been one of the problems really with the uh, consideration of taking forward these important recommendations. Uh, quite often, commitment to funding this year will have a recurrent impact on future years, and that, is, that has been very, very challenging for the Minister because we don't, up until now, we don't know, you know what the, the future year budgets will look like. But essentially, in my view, it will require additional funding to take those recommendations forward because they, it is likely whatever budget settlement we get, it's likely to be very tight. And these are additional pressures. So yes, certainly if there was a three year, if there was a three year additional budget for Fair Start, it'd be very welcome. Okay. And very and necessary. Just finally, if you don't mind, Chair, uh, the issue you, you yourself raised, Chris, about uh, 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 the commitments to teacher and non-teaching staff pay in terms and conditions. Did I hear you right, uh, Gary, in saying that you weren't absolutely certain that you could fulfill the commitments that have been made? No, no, definitely not. Any commitments that have been made to staff will be honoured. There's no question about that. The challenge for the department is just making sure that we have enough budget cover year on year. And there's been no, there's been no bid put forward for any Pay, teachers pay settlement, for example, for this year because negotiations are still ongoing there. Okay. But the, the, the approach we have taken is essentially to bid for the resources as they require, as settlements are agreed. The challenge we face every year is making sure that those pressures are baseline, they're part of our baseline. And that's what hasn't been happening and didn't happen this year, although we did get a contribution, a reasonable contribution towards it at the start of the year, but we're still short certain elements as, a, as a, we identified in October monitoring. But definitely and, any, any commitments that have been made to staff will be honoured. There's no question about that. I'm sorry, but is there still a shortfall at the minute? Are you going to have to bid for that in January? Yes, we'll be bidding again. We'll be reassessing the pressures at that point in time because uh, to, uh, the thing the education authority, their identification of their pressures, block grant pressures and the school's pressures will actually become clearer within the next couple of months, just the way that the finances work with this, the school year starting in September. So we'll have a clearer view, but yes, we will definitely be bidding for those because they're, they're inescapable pressures and they'll invariably work their way through the system and lead to school, you know, increasing school deficits or education authority overspend. Okay. Potentially. Thanks, Pat. All right. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Pat. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA, please? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. And can I thank Gary and his team uh, for being with us today? I suppose, like others, I, I do welcome and um, we welcome the, in the, the chamber the investment in the special needs uh, pupils and education. I think that was was a, a, a good good move. I do, uh, and it was not unexpected indeed that um, health got uh, the priority that, that it did get. But I did make this point to the health minister, sorry, to the finance minister in, in the chamber that uh, education as a priority and investing in education has indeed an impact on health. And all the studies, uh, OECD studies, indicate that where you invest in the uh, education of, of pupils, you get a, uh, a healthier lifestyle, healthier pupils, 
and indeed people who actually live longer. So there is an argument that if you want to take the pressures off health, that you invest in education in a much more uh, longer term and strategic way. And I suppose as a committee, the education committee will want to push to see that the Minister for Finance uh, in 2023 uh, supports uh, indeed the education bids uh, to a greater extent. So maybe our focus uh, will be on the Minister for Finance to make sure that the funding uh, for the crucial recovery uh, of, of, of our young people uh, and that the support packages that we uh, the minister asks for indeed will, will, will be adequately funded. Yeah. I do have um, concerns like the, the new uh, chair uh, around the PPE and I do think uh, uh, that maybe if Guy and his team could keep us up to date, that, that would be uh, useful yeah. and very helpful. Can I maybe, Gary, turn to uh, just two uh, areas? Um, in in uh, paragraph 46, uh, of uh, I'm trying to, and I can't find it any, anywhere else, but indeed the funding for addressing mental health issues. Um, uh, now, it's down here as reallocated within the overall well-being of pastoral support. Uh, are we there getting professional help in addressing and are you budgeted for professional help in, in addressing the mental health issues of, of our, our young people? Yes, I mean, that, that is being taken forward at school level, uh, particularly through the counselling service and the, the existing counselling contract. So some of, the, some of these other amounts that are referred to are additional amounts to supplement. Uh, particularly with, with all that has happened over the last couple of years, year and a half, two years. Uh, so, yeah, the, I mean, there's, it's, a, it's a very, it's, it's an area that is being taken forward proactively, both by the Education Authority and across schools. And funding has been made. Uh, I mean, this, this is, as you say, this is the only reference within the October monitoring bids, but there is funding already being made available to schools to take forward uh, a lot of the mental health strategy issues. Okay. And in paragraph 49, uh, which is highlighted up the youth service, um, and you've indicated that there's a million pounds to enable youth providers without sufficient IT access. I can't find any other area, maybe I just haven't spotted it, um, in terms of pupils uh actually getting sufficient it support have we any uh, i know that there are there is some there for for teachers but are, are we clear that all the pupils have this sufficient it support for for the, the required uh, I, as far as I'm aware, I think there is a confidence that, that there is that support out there. There was a lot of money put in last year to assist and to move quickly in making sure that both pupils and teachers had as much remote access and uh, accessibility to, to uh, learning. So I think, yeah, I think that I don't want to give a definitive view, but my, my understanding is that, that there's confidence that pupils have what access that they need if they didn't that would be that would have been drawn to our attention as uh, a bit at october monitoring and we haven't had that Seamus, okay. i don't know whether you want to yeah, there is a, a capital bid that's been met for supply of digital services on your first start of half a million are we, are we, not, we, we were treating that as resource earlier we're not are we we're not moving to capital until yeah, it's been changed in their capital program. Where it well, was a resource program before. Well, that probably that what Seamus has said there probably answers your question to some extent. There had there is some additional money going to go into that to providing devices for for children, um, and that's through the capital and all of the capital bids were were met. But presumably we'll come to that shortly. Okay, okay, that's me, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Can I bring in 
Daniel McCrossan, and there they please. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for uh, the information shared uh, this morning. Uh, I have a number of, of questions. I'll go straight to it. Guy, you indicated that uh, dual sites costs are grow a, a growing problem. I don't, I don't think that was ever much of a secret because there's many that have raised it over the course of the last number of years. Can you tell us more about this particular uh, situation? What exactly is the nature of the problems that uh, you've now uh, raised? And also note that you uh, expressed reservations about the EA's costings of these pressures. What problems do you have with the EA's projections in that regard? Well, it's not a new problem, as, as you say. Um, I think certainly my concern as finance, the department's finance director was that uh, a number of these schools were left in, the, in an element of uncertainty about whether they were going to get sufficient funding to cover the ongoing dual site costs. So. I suppose we wanted to bring about a position, a uh, more secure position, really, for those schools. Um, I'll maybe pass over to Stephen on the on the Education Authority's estimate point. Yeah, well, I, I suppose um, because the because the Education Authority was in a position where they had to go back and look at, at, at a number of schools, um, you know, part of the way they fund it is to, you know, the, a school effectively puts in a business case to identify the additional costs um, over and above what a normal school would 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 require or, or what those additional costs are as a result of working on it across the split site. So they had they had a, a few business cases in, um, but our concern was that the, the value of those business cases were a little bit high. And by using those the, the small sample to extrapolate across the rest of the split site schools, it, it, it looked a little bit a little bit high. Um, and I suppose the other issue is that you know previously uh, some of the schools that needed to be revisited hadn't been um, you know, they hadn't been raising any issues with regards to the, the dual site funding, so it, it would beg the question, do, do those particular schools need, you know, significant uh, amounts of additional funding or, or can they, or have they historically been able to fund it out of their existing budget? So that's, that, that, that's why there's, we're still trying to um, ground uh, that position out with the EA. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm um, actually, I was yeah, going to say... Ahead. I was going to say that's an illustration, I suppose, of, of our role and function in this, uh, that we don't just automatically bid for everything that comes in our direction because we we have built uh, a confidence with our DOF supply colleagues that whatever bids are submitted have been robustly challenged by ourselves. So it's not to say that we'll not necessarily bid for more of January monitoring if need be. Okay. So with, with that said, uh, 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 and given the growing numbers of split site schools, Across Northern Ireland, are you confident that you have the way of that you have a way of making a more accurate uh, prediction of what resource is actually needed there? From what you're saying, yes. All right. Okay. And you suggest in recent times that the department has looked carefully at this uh, growing need. Why has it taken the department so long to do this? Because uh, I know that I I was aware of this as far back as uh, when my predecessor was in place, Joe Byrne, in 2012. Um, I just had to scan back there to see, it, and it was raised even back then um, in the assembly. So why is it taking the department so long to identify this as an issue? Uh, well, there would have been ongoing, we, we would have been liaising with the Education Authority on the issue over certainly in the years that I've been in this role. I think we just felt it was probably time maybe to take the bull by the horns a bit more and just clarify the position on behalf of these schools. So yeah, it was, a, Perhaps it was just a timing issue with so many other things having been going on over the last few years, but it's certainly not something that I wanted to see sitting any longer. Okay, uh, just to, I want to touch on the Struel campus. I know that uh, we'll be bringing that up, but I'm just sitting with a letter here dated today from the Minister for Education that's just landed with me with the predicted cost of the overall project. Uh, it says that from the, the, the latest cost estimate from October 21, uh, to program completion, um, a future investment of 184 million is required. That's on top of the 46 million already spent. Uh, when you sorry, break that, that, is that, sorry, just to cut, uh, is that Struel you're raising there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna come back to capital and then to Struel as well. If you hold okay. that question, I'll make that, sure you that, come in on that if that's okay. Yeah. That's fine, chair. I'll just go to this next okay. question. If that's okay. Um, just on the course at the moment. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I note that some money allocated for the relief uh, of problems associated with COVID was handed back by the Education Authority, some three, uh, 3.595 million. Uh, 
Can you explain why that was, uh, Gary, and why there was no way that this money could have been reclassified and spent on other COVID relief measures? And also, you satisfied that the Education Authority explored very, every potential avenue for reclassification before the funding was returned? Yeah, I mean, it was mainly linked to the school holiday food grant payments, uh, where they estimated pressures, basically the uptake of universal credit, etc., hadn't increased to the extent that had originally been estimated. And, and, and to be fair, on the Education Authority, it was a difficult area to estimate with any great degree of accuracy. Uh, we weren't, because that was very specifically ring-fenced, we couldn't, there was no negotiation that had to be handed back. Although what I would say is, uh, there is there was still the opportunity, and there's the ongoing opportunity for us to bid for resources that are COVID-related. So, uh, you know, it's not a closed door necessarily, but there are quite strict conditions to a lot of these funds that they can only be spent for the purpose that they were intended. Okay, uh, just share briefly on, on this next point. Um, in June uh, of uh, this year, uh, in the monitoring round, the department identified total pressures of 178.9 million. So considering you sought 75.42 million, which is identified in the pack, um, after you factored in the money just allocated, 20.7 million, what are the biggest immediate pressures now based in the department? Well, they would still be the areas that we have, uh, the unmet pressures that we identified at October monitoring, you know, the, the, the various, the list of pressures of it that are shown in basically the areas that we have bid for, pay pressures, uh, uh, still ongoing some send pressures, school maintenance, etc., and, and EA block grant. But it's a matter, I suppose, they are a concern to us at this stage. Uh, we, are st we would still be hopeful that money might be available at January monitoring. So as long as we can get the money uh, in. Uh, is there a plan in place, Gary, to, 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 to deal with it, to cope with these particular pressures? So what happens if, if the money doesn't come? Well, it's a matter of all of us, the Education Authority, schools, you know, doing what they can. But the problem, as, as members will be aware, there are issues around the, the funding of the sector generally. And if, if that there is a limit to what extent, uh, you know, costs can be turned on and off in the education sector, probably more so than other departments, because there's so much of our costs are associated with staff costs. And even if you are, you know, if staff are uh, taking early re early retirement or whatever, it takes time to, to implement that or to move staff on in any way. So none of this can be done quickly. So it is really tricky and it's always been a challenge. With, with, that, said, yeah, with that said, obviously the key objective is to ensure minimal disruption to children's education and deliver yeah. uh, education for all our kids. So how do you minimize the uh, disruption or impact on children's education given that situation? Well, certainly the focus has always been, and when we're developing a budget strategy for every year, the focus is always on those frontline services, if you like, the impact on children and young people, and ensuring that any disruption is absolutely minimised, and that funding, as far as possible, continues to make its way through to those services, to schools and youth organisations, etc. Uh, the reality is if we, we could potentially be faced with an overspend as a department at the end of the year, so that would be the consequence, I suppose. Now, longer term, if we get a very poor budget settlement for the next three years, that, that I suppose, could put the sector in more of a crisis where their decisions will have to be made of what can and can't be taken forward. And okay. Then, and that Just probably en that, that enters the political realm as much as anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thanks for that, guy. Just a separate note. Is the 19.829 million for teachers' laptops secured funding? That, that's the money that we got in here that you're referring to. Yeah, the total, the total funding yes, for teachers. Yeah, 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 yes, that was that was that was secured early in the year. So that's, okay. That's all in hand. And did you secure two million capital funding to purchase the CO two monitors as part of the monitoring round? Coming to capital next, Daniel. Yeah, but it's just a yes or no chair. Yes. <laughs> did it? Yeah, the yes. <laughs> But there's more to it. There's more to it than that. Yeah, um, I know that. I'm just, I'm just. <laughs> okay. Out. Okay. Thanks very much, Gary. Thank you. No problem. Okay, thanks for that, Daniel. Can I bring Diane and Justin on uh, resource and then we'll move on to capital issues, Gary. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, thank you um, and thank you to the team um, for an, an interesting presentation. Um, 
a, a lot of, of what I wanted to raise has been raised around um, the money bid for and the money received. So I'm not going to go over all of that. Um, what I'm interested in uh, noting is that in January, um, you will bid for how much on teachers' pay and pressures? Well, we'll reassess. The I know position. you can't. I know you're waiting an outcome of a settlement. What's the ballpark yeah. figure that you're looking for? Well, in terms of end year, it'll be somewhere along the same lines as what we've bid for at October monitoring. Right. Under those, under those various headings. Now, we'll, we, the position will be reviewed. Uh, an so that will be the nine million, the three point eight million, and the yes. seven point seven million. Yes. And yes. you um, will need to get that in January. Not the teachers won't get their 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 anything that is due, but to, to in order to keep yes. the department yes. right. If That's you don't right. get that, what will you cut? Well, we would have to take a view coming up to January monitoring once we have a better idea of what way school spend is going and that, that will become clearer to the education authority later this month, early next month. Uh, that, that may indicate that actually schools are being able to absorb some of this pressure because of, uh, for example, the additional money that has gone in to address COVID related issues. So we don't know yet until we see the, those spend figures coming through. Uh, that certainly happened last year, where we didn't get all of our inescapable pressures, but because there was a lot of additional COVID money went into the system, it actually benefited schools. So we need to take a view in the round coming up to January monitoring, but certainly at this stage, we still see those pay pressures as inescapable. The only one that, that we don't see as inescapable at this stage is the, the this year's teaching pay, teacher's pay settlement, which is currently, it's under negotiation, so it's not firm yet. Okay, okay. Um, that leads me into what I think is a really interesting part of this discussion. And you have said yourself just now that much of the funding or some of the pressures that you're putting forward in monitoring bids may well be less of a pressure because of the additional funding that you get for resource via one-off COVID monies that will have to be spent and out of the system be at the end of March um, next year in 2022. Am I right? Is that, That's is that right, accurate? yeah. yeah. Bas okay. Basically, we have to take, as the year progresses, we have to take a view in the round, looking at all the pressures to see where, because okay. my focus some, is some on... Some of that yeah. COVID money, even though it was allocated for a specific instance, you can transfer it within the department to use on other pressures. Yes. No. No, we can't. But we what we discovered last year was even though there was a lot of money going in for very specific purposes, it still had a beneficial impact overall on school finances. And that that's what that doesn't become clear until we see what school spend is, is beginning to look like as the year progresses. Okay. So and and this leads me on because I think the monitoring rounds are interesting. Um, because they show some sort of longer term issues that we will need to deal with. Northern Ireland has the lowest spend per capita or per, per, per pupil um, on education in the whole of the four regions of the United Kingdom. If we are to address not just the issues of COVID, but to really have that world class education system for everybody in Northern Ireland, that is an issue that we need to address. And that can only be addressed by getting a budget in the comprehensive spending review that actually matches the need um, within uh, the school system in Northern Ireland. If COVID money, which has been very valuable, but I suspect will not be available um, in the next number of years, um, is not available, what is the additional funding that you think that you need just to meet baseline pressures and to, to add value in terms of their start um, and all of the other things that we need to do in education? What's the pressures in the uh, for you with the comprehensive spending review? Well, essentially, we have identified pressures based on a baseline that we have been given to work, uh, every department has been given a baseline to work with when we've been planning uh, or, or providing information 
was a bit better way of putting it for future mm -hmm. years exercises. So we were given a baseline. Now on top of that baseline, we have estimated certainly for next year that we'd be requiring probably an extra 350 million. Uh, and as you say, to, is, sorry, because I think this is this is massively important. Is that to stand still, or is that to add value? Is that to, for example, fund Fair Start? Is that to start to look at the 14 to 19 year old strategy and how we can get a a, a much more um, dynamic system for young people in Northern Ireland at that age? Is it to stand still or is it to add value? Stephen, you can keep well, me it, writing the yeah. figures, but it's essentially, those are inescapable pressures, really, the 300. So that's to stand right, still. Wouldn't doing, yeah, it uh, wouldn't be doing an awful uh, lot. Ahead of your baseline, you will need next year 330 million. Yes. Wow. And, and it's linked as well, partly to the fact, uh, well, it's fundamentally linked to the fact that our baseline every year doesn't reflect what we actually should have or need in yeah. our baseline. So it is a problem. So the pressures next year will be 330 million. Will that take into account? Is, I mean, I mean, are we factoring in? Because we, we need to know this, because as a committee, if we really want to see Fair Start implemented, mm -hmm. if we want to see a 14 to 19 year old strategy implemented, if we want to see, you know, fairer outcomes for all of our pupils, you know, this is the sort of information that we need because this is this is the essential stuff. So three hundred and thirty million is a standstill position. It's not an additional. Yeah, no, those, the, it's obviously based on estimates, but that's what we yeah. estimate you know, up up to three hundred and fifty million next year. Up to three hundred and fifty million. Yeah, that is a yeah. huge pressure on the budget. Yeah. Um, next year. Um, I, would agree, I would agree. And when you mentioned fair start, I mean, my strong view is that that will require additional. I mean, they're, they're very important recommendations that need to be taken forward, but they do require additional money. It can't. I think that there's a risk in assuming that certain things can be taken forward without additional money. OK, you see, I, I just think that that pressure cannot all fall on schools. Or that pressure cannot all fall on individual teachers, um, on on the make do and men thing. Because I I have been talking to a lot of schools in my constituency over the last number of weeks, and many of those schools re report post um, COVID and and children being back in situ in class, very very specific problems that they have to deal with, mm -hmm. um, and they will not they they will not stop with the end of COVID money in March. 2022, they will be ongoing problems that schools will continue to need uh, to be addressed. And and that that is a, a very significant pressure. So really the pressure is is huge on the education budget. Um, yeah. And if, we, I mean, I go back to Robin Newton's point, education and health are in a, inextricably linked. They, they, they reflect on off each other. Um, and if, if we are to have a healthy population, then a population that is, you know, able to go out to work, engage in the labour market, do all of the things that we need to do um, is absolutely vitally important. OK, okay. That's, that's fine. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Diane. Gary, before I bring Justin, if I could just supplement some of those questions from Diane really quickly that are, are really important and that got raised with a few of us at the recent um, National Association of Head Teachers yeah. event. So... If, um, if indeed Northern Ireland spends the smallest amount per capita on education in these islands, why is that the case? Do, do we have less money um, for education than the other regions of these islands or do we use it less efficiently? Uh, I suppose these are questions that the independent panel the review of education will be looking at and considering. Uh, I would caveat, as I always do, that uh, when we're comparing, when comparisons are made with other UK regions, it's it's not always a direct like for like comparison. But I, I don't think there's any question that, you know, that certainly for the way the education sector is currently operating, uh, there, there are constant pressures that we're constantly bidding for every year. So Okay, so, so try, just to try and just try and break it down. Then do do 
do pupils in Northern Ireland get less spent on them in education than the rest of these islands? The figures would seem to indicate that, yes. Okay. But as I say, and, it's not and, directly and as, for like comparison. Okay. And as director of finance for education, mm -hmm. why? Well, it, has to, it, it, it has to be linked to progressive underfunding over the last number of years and the lack of certainty around budgets moving forward and the lack of baselining just, just even to, to cover what is required every year is a challenge every year. So now we do, now in sense, we have to emphasize we, we're successful in year in getting additional resources, but it's not a good way. It's not a good way to plan. Okay, this, this, this issue is caused, it, it, in my assessment, it's actually starting to cause quite a bit of distress, quite a bit of demotivation, quite a bit of anger. Um, can, can, you, can you prepare a, a paper, you know, a, a reasonably evidence-based paper or some sort of briefing for this committee with regards to that premise that there is less spent per pupil in Northern Ireland than in other regions of these islands? Can you, can you speak to that and can you offer an explanation if that is the case as to why it is the case and with, with reference to whether it has anything to do with how we spend money rather than how much money we have to spend? I could pull together, I certainly would want to be as helpful as possible to the committee and pull together what I can. What I wouldn't want to do, I suppose, is tread on the toes of the independent panel. Okay, well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't ask this frivolously. It's, it is genuinely my assessment that this, and you'll know this yourself. It's, it's a, it's becoming a perennial issue, uh, an oft-reference, um, you know, presumed piece of evidence without, without any, with you know, and I think it merits more interrogation as to if it is the case and if it is the case, why. You know, surely we should be, we should have clarity as to whether or not that is the case, because it's frustrating a lot of people, teachers, school leaders, elected representatives, um, pupils. Uh, we should know if it is the case clearly, and we should know why it's the case so that we can target our efforts to address it. And if that is more funding, then, as you said, there's a bit of a political challenge there in terms of how we um, access more funding, whatever way that's done and whether it is how we do things differently as well. There's obviously a significant project of reform set out for health, um, and, and I'd be interested to see if reform is, is necessary for education as well, but um, obviously you need to keep us moving yeah. here. So I'll bring I'm, just I'm, I'm, certainly, I'm, there, certainly yeah. happy, I'm certainly happy to take that away. We'll give it some thought what, we, what would, yeah. could, would be helpful okay. for you. No, and Appreciate saying that, that, I think, what you're really asking for potentially is the outcome, the final outcome of the independent review of, of education. But we can certainly provide what we what we can. It'll not be a straightforward answer necessarily, but we, we okay. want to be helpful to the committee, obviously. Okay, thank you. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA, please, on resource, and then we'll move on to capital. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Hey, folks. Um, in terms of the SEND shortfall of 21 million, even allowing for this monitoring rounds provision, there is still a sufficient gap in funding. What contingency plans do you have to meet the needs of those pupils who are particularly in need, and, you know, the most need in terms of our education? What, what contingency, contingency plans are there to help meet their needs? Uh, the, well, their needs will be met. That's that's not what's at stake here. I think what is at stake here is because the, so many of the, the SEND services are demand-led, they have to be met. They, there's a, a responsibility on, the, on all of us really to ensure that they are met. The challenge from my point of view is that uh, if we don't get those additional resources in year, subject to obviously reassessing the position of January monitoring, we could be potentially heading towards an overspend as a department. Gary, you say that those it's demand led, demand met, and so you're you're saying in a broad brush way that all the demands for um, needs for children with special educational needs are being met in schools. When we all, as elected representatives, know that's not the case. Okay. It's it's just not the case, and. Um, 
We've had presentations here at our committee by Dyslexia NA. We've had presentations in relation to autism in terms of the lack of funding they're in. How can you sit here today and tell us that the demands are met and that the sufficient funding is there to meet those demands? Because that's not what we're hearing on a day on day on basis, basis from, from our constituents. Well, I, I obviously couldn't comment on specific instances. Uh, I deal with the finances, obviously, and from my point of view, bids are submitted by uh, the Education Authority for where they see the pressures hitting on SEN. We bid for those resources, secure what we can, and continue to bid. Uh, obviously, the uh, SEN, pre SEN pressures are a significant pressure on the Education Authority's block grant budget, probably take up about 50% of their block grant budget. So it's again looking at things in the round as the year progresses to see where that might land. But uh, you know, I can't comment obviously on whether every need is being met in terms of social education needs, but I do know that what is coming to me are demand-led pressures that there's very little choice about and the spend has to happen. It may not, you know, every individual may not be getting what you know what the expectation might be, but the you know, what I'm seeing coming through are the pressures that the Education Authority are facing. And they are trying they have to try and manage that within budget, but that's unmanageable in a sense if we don't get a sufficient additional resources in year. Okay, look I can say Caligardi that the demands are not being met. Um, and you may be getting bids which you're honouring, but the demands of children and their families are not being met. Um, I want to touch on the terms of the health piece that both um, Diane and Robin referred to, and which I think I feel is is very very relevant. And um, I note that the being well, doing well, pilot for mental health and emotional well-being was delayed to the extent that 1.135 million had to be surrendered. Considering there is a massive need to support children's well-being, do you consider this to be a scandal? Uh, well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be commenting with with emotive terms. I mean, my my job as finance director is to seek the resources that are required to secure those resources, and I work with policy colleagues and education authority colleagues to try and make sure that we have the resources that are needed. That's my focus. Okay, why why could that scheme not be progressed? Sorry. Why was that scheme not progressed? Well, we, we would probably need to um, we'd need to liaise with the policy lead on that for the for the specifics. All right. Has the, has the department launched an investigation into the reasons for the uh, failure of that scheme to progress? We we wouldn't be the right people to ask, but that that specific level of detail. Okay. And um, do you think there should be an investigation into why that scheme couldn't be progressed? I wouldn't want to comment on that myself. Um. And considering the massive issues and concerns there are um, exacerbated by the pandemic, do you think that the departments would need to uh, endeavour to make up lost ground in this, in this endeavour going forward? Well, I think uh, with all the various pots of funding that have been allocated to the sector, I think there is very much a focus on ensuring that children and young people uh, catch up as much as possible from any lost learning over the the period the duration of the pandemic so that there is a real focus and I know that certainly at the school level principals and teachers are really focused on making sure that, that happens my job is obviously to work with colleagues to secure the additional resources that are required along the way okay thanks Gary and back back on to special education needs in terms of the 2021-22 EA pressures of 42.1 million which excludes uh, special education needs and pay pressures. Have you recalculated that figure and what is it now? Uh, when you say recalculated, do you mean, have I challenged, I suppose, what the education authorities come through with? Yeah, and what's, what's your figure? Well, we, well our, 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 what we felt we could stand over at the point when we were submitting the October monitoring bids was about 19 odd million, which we bid for. So it was the bulk, really, of what they were looking for. There were just some elements that we felt we needed to engage a bit more with the Education Authority on. Right, specifically, um, what is the 5.23 Education Authority head, headquarters cost identified as monitoring pressure? 
Because this is some the departments um, can stand over as reasonable. Yeah, uh, sorry, if I, if I could take that. <clears throat> um, that's, uh, um, I suppose it's posts within the education authority, uh, you know, which have been identified as you know, ne needing to be filled to address kind of key areas within the EA's business plan that they want to deliver, and as well to address uh, key risks uh, that identified in their corporate risk register. Um, and, and the EA probably would be at pains to, uh, that they, they probably wouldn't appreciate us using the terms headquarters because there are, you know, there are posts in there that do have kind of a direct bearing on, you know, delivery of services into schools. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of spread out across a number of different areas. Um, there, there's a small pressure within the children and young people services, um, uh, with, within the operations and estates. Um, there's about a 2.3 million pound pressure, um, across uh, a variety of areas. Um, and then, uh, you know, there, there is a pressure uh, within fi finance and ICT of about 1.6 million. Um, and, and quite a bit of that would be focused on, you know, trying to get a, a, to grip, uh, you know, with, with schools expenditure and, and assisting schools. Uh, and, then, and then small amounts uh, with, within the chief executive's office. And then also uh, a, a small amount for uh, not 0.8 uh, or 800,000 for uh, human resources. So it's a good group. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Can the department assure us that the Education Authority is operating effectively and efficiently and accruing this level of escapable and um, pressures? Uh, well, as, as far as, as we have the information, uh, we, we meet regularly with Education Authority colleagues, particularly myself with the Finance Director. Uh, uh, we also meet with the Chief Executive on a monthly basis, so we, we get assurances. We, we, we have to operate on their assurances. There's a, there's a lot of challenge, obviously, goes on, given the nature of the relationship between a department and an arm's length body. So we don't take things at face value necessarily. But we do recognise, you know, certainly in terms of, of what are referred to as headquarters costs, that, as Stephen says, they would dispute that title, because I think it can be a bit misleading. Uh, we, we would probably share their concerns uh, that in certain parts of the organization there are risk areas that they need the right staff or the right skills in to deal with. But it's tricky. It's, tri it's back to the same issue that we've been discussing really. The underfunding of the sector and really an evaluation of what is required to operate an effective business, uh, an effective organization. But in answer to your question, we, have, we seek the assurances regularly. From the education authority and i'm comfortable with the assurances that have been given you know, i I've, i fully recognize and uh, appreciate the um, efforts of the education authority and the chief executive who i, I feel is a person of honor um, but there were many concerns highlighted with us at a meeting a number of weeks back which the chair attended also from the national association of head national association of head teachers um, around bureaucracy in EA, can the department satisfy? Is the department satisfied that EA is delivering value for money with its services? Uh, I suppose there, there was an area of work. There is an area of work that we would be keen to see taken forward. That it has been delayed by COVID. That's the Education Authority Financial Recovery Plan, planning work that their their board was considering and seeking to take forward. That has been delayed a bit. I think that will be a helpful piece of work once it when it's completed because it will look at the organization as a whole and should identify any areas where they feel that they could be more efficient or areas where there are risks and shortfalls and in, in the staffing levels or funding that they need uh, it, it's difficult i suppose without that overall view being taken to know now and saying that the landscape review the education authority may identify some of this as well uh, there's no question that the Education Authority as an organization faces significant challenges. We try, we obviously challenge them uh, on an ongoing basis, but we, we understand as well some of those challenges that they face and we try to be as supportive as we can. It's not an easy landscape essentially when uh, the Education Authority budget isn't sufficient and there's this ongoing battle every year to get what we need. Uh, but it's certain, certainly we keep close with Education Authority colleagues. I couldn't comment, uh, you're referring to some references there, to excessive bureaucracy. It's, it's difficult to comment on a general statement like that without knowing exactly what it's meant. Uh, okay. We certainly seek and get the assurances that we need on an ongoing basis, but there are issues. We're, we're not blind to the reality that, that the EI faces issues that they're 
seeking to address? Folks, thank you all for your answers. Thank you very much for your presence today. No thank you. Hi, thanks, Justin. Guy, before I move us on to capital, that all of the challenges that we've discussed there also do not include approximately fifty million pounds per annum that is needed to uh, meet the early education and child care proposals either, does it? No. Okay, so we can add that to the list as well then. Yeah, and um, and that, I suppose that's but that's really an executive an executive uh, issue as well. Wherever it comes from, it's not there at this moment in time. No. 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 Okay. Can we move to capital? And do you want to include Strule in the capital presentation, given that it is largely a capital matter? Yeah. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Thanks, Gary. I'll just move the speaker down a bit so you can hear me. The the audio is pretty clear so far. So thank you. And I start with just a wee bit about the capital, and then we'll hand over to yeah. Jennifer for Stroud. Thank you. Good evening. Um, DE was initially got allocated 158.3 million, and that included 11.5 million of fresh start funding. Uh, cap the capital budget was increased to 195 million as a result of successful bids in June monitoring, and a total of 11.5 million pounds of bids were made the DOF in the October monitor and that included 3.3 million of COVID funding and all of those bids were met in full. So really those were eight million pounds for minor works. Um, reclassification of some receipt income, a COVID funding for teachers laptops, just a small top up of 0.8 million, uh, half a million for fair start provision of laptops to pupils and two million for CO2 monitors and, and other related COVID equipment. And I'll hand over to Sinead for the drill part. Okay. Actually do you know what? Is it worth maybe take a few quick questions on, on that on those that October October monitor and on capital um given that it, it is a bit more straightforward and that the bids were met and then we'll come straight to you on the stream there. Um Sinead, thank you. Um can I can I kick us off just by asking in terms of the, the CO two monitor um bid? Can I can I can I ask why it took us until October to bid for funding to provide CO two monitors in schools given the well established knowledge that ventilation is a key mitigation against the spread of COVID nineteen. Um, we did make a an allocation already to the EA of a of a hundred thousand to purchase some monitors, which which has been proved sufficient so far in terms of demand. So this is this is about the wider rollout of the monitors in the all schools. Okay, and. Um, if why why is it only two million pounds um, for schools in Northern Ireland, and will this allocation fund not only CO two monitors but also air filtration devices for our schools? Yeah, it covers air filter filtration devices, um, and all of it will be allocated or based on need and demand. And we we okay. get at this point that it's enough, yeah. And we think that's going to meet the need. Okay. Um, my my other question, Minor Works um, bid was eight million, and eight million was allocated. It it seemed that very few bids have actually been met in full, but this bid of eight million for Minor Works has been met in full. Um, is that does that indicate that the executive and the finance minister um, are aware of just how? serious the state of repair of our schools actually are and given the size of that bid how serious is this the inadequate state of repair of our schools at this moment in time uh, i think it probably allocates that the pressures on the capital budget are not as severe as the pressures on the resource budget in terms of the money that's available um in, ter in terms of the state of the schools state we could probably spend 500 million on the school estate every year and 
still spend 10 years bringing it up to where we would like it to be, but we're constrained by the budget and then we have to allocate money where in a priority order where it's most required to give us the greatest benefit. Okay. Okay, let me bring in other members if they have any questions on the October Monitor and Capital Programme allocations, and then we'll move swiftly on to Stroll. Uh, Deputy Chairperson Pat Shane, do you want to ask a question, Pat? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just following on from your own question and around the, the, the CO2 devices and your filtration systems. Um, who, who in the department would have been responsible for calculating uh, what was needed for that bid? Uh, the, the, the Department and in, in the Investment and Infrastructure Director would have worked closely with EA to determine what was required. <coughs> It, it, it just it, it just seems to me, first of all, I mean, we're a year and a half into this pandemic and there's only a bid going in now. Um, Wales was way ahead of the posse a considerable period uh, of time ago uh, and invested over six million, I think it was, uh, in their system. Um, is there any explanation as to why it took so long for this bid uh, to come forward? And secondly... Is there confidence in the department that uh, two million pound is sufficient to cover all the sort of uh, air filtration or CO two devices or ventilation uh, processes that they needed in our schools? At the minute, we're confident that the the two million will will serve as a baseline. We'll obviously keep the thing under review, and I can't comment on it as to why the bid was made in the October monitor and I don't know. I, I think the issue with, with the department bid, can you hear me okay? The yes, Gary, you know, you're loud and clear. Um, the issue really with any bids are, uh, a lot of the time it's bids that are drawn to the department's attention by the education authority through schools or whatever. So I, I don't know exactly the detail on this, but I imagine that was something similar. There was so much, such a flurry of activity identifying what the key needs were last year, both in resource and capital front relating to the pandemic. Uh, and, and that is possibly part of the explanation as to why this has come through a bit later in the day. But essentially bids are drawn to the department's attention. We go through the robust uh, process of challenging, etc., and where appropriate bidding for those resources. Okay, thanks for that. that that's all I have, Chris, thank you. Thanks, Pat. Can I bring in Robin Newton on uh, Capital? Thank you, Chair. I've, I've really just uh, uh, really maybe looking more for an explanation rather than a, a direct question. Um, and now, now I can't find it. Um, it was about the... You'd made a statement in there, uh, Gary, about the... Uh, pressures um, that the construction industry is under in terms of um, uh, inflation and uh, um, I can't find it now. <laughs> um, uh, and you, you weren't quite sure what the implications of that might well be. Um, do you know what I'm referring to? Yes. Yeah, construction uh, uh, 52, paragraph 52. Um, you've said, given the levels of uncertainty around the lim li likely yeah. impact of the issues being experienced, could you maybe just quantify that a wee bit more for us? I'll pass over to Seamus. Well, it's very difficult to, to quantify, but the prices of some materials have gone up massively to 300% in, in, in recent months. But we, we do expect that that prices will start to settle down in the early part of the new year. So the executive agreed a, a, a measure to help contractors, the PAN notice, which basically would take account of the fact that they couldn't reason, reasonably have anticipated this level of inflation. And we will put in a process to assist contractors through the difficult time, but obviously it will increase the cost of capital cost of some projects which are currently in construction. But it's things like price of wood, price of steel, 
even the availability of some, some materials and labour. So prices have generally been pushed up considerably, way beyond normal levels of inflation. I am, I am, outside of education, I am aware of a number of capital projects that have been delayed uh, because the anticipated budget, um, when the actual budget was submitted, uh, was considerably higher. I note that you've indicated a number of large post-primary school contracts are due to be signed in the next few months. Are we anticipating that any of the uh, contracts may well be delayed in this situation? We are aware of one contract which has been delayed. Uh, St. Ronan's, uh, really because it, the bidders weren't prepared to stand over the prices that they had bid. So it, 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 legal advice that we would have to retender it. So therefore there's probably a six to nine month delay in that one. We are yeah, hopeful that that, being covered in the press. Yeah. Yeah. We are hopeful that, that all of the other tenders will go ahead and that we'd be able to appoint contractors without any delay. Can't guarantee that, but that is currently still the position that we're working to. Uh, can you just say what the number of the contracts was? Is it five? Is it ten? Is it twenty? Oh I don't have a number two hand. I would imagine that, that we we appointing contractors on up to a dozen contracts in the next nine months. Okay, so around, around 12 contracts are facing. I can confirm a number at a later point. Okay, well, that, that would be useful. That would be useful. Okay, thank, thank you, Joe. That's, that's Thanks, Robin. Anything else you want to add to that? That's me. Thanks, Robin. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan on uh, Capital? And then we'll go to Strew after that as well. Chair, can I go go into Stroud now? No, I, I'm I'm keen to hear the briefing from Stroud before we go into it. But I I I'll, I'll bring you in properly in once we go to Stroud. If you don't have questions on capital, that's okay. I'll get us the Stroud. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, just to do yeah yeah. Um, with no funding set aside for uh, guy for VES, uh, but three point one million requested. Uh, do you? Let me see this. Look at this here. No, chair, shoot on. I'll go to stool for a misplaced. That's okay. That's okay. I'll bring, I'll bring you back in. Diane, uh, uh, Diane Dodds, MLA, do you'd like to ask about capital um, before we take our stool briefing? Just just a, a, a quick speculative question, uh, chair. Um, we've had uh, a number of um, conversations with EA over the issue of ventilation in schools. They did tell us that they were doing a survey of schools to see what those ventilation needs were. Did you get a bid from the EA around any of this? That, that's included in the, the two million pounds allocated for CO2 monitors and ventilation. So the ventilation needs of all schools in Northern Ireland were 200 or two million um, and that includes monitors and ventilation equipment. Right. I thought that they were actually surveying schools to see whether classrooms needed windows fixed or whatever. <coughs> yeah, the windows fixed like and that? stuff will be, will be part of the normal minors, minor, minor works bid, which fixing windows is just normal maintenance, and that's included in the £8 million. Right, so that, that is where that bid sits. And was that identified specifically for that purpose? I'm just, uh, all, I'm, all I'm keen to know, and I know that this information might have come to you, we have tried to get a clear answer from EA as to what they are doing around the issue of ventilation in schools. It seems to me that it's sometimes that what they're doing is telling teachers to open a window. Now, in some cases that might work, but if it's the middle of January and it's blowing a gale, it might not work. It wouldn't be very pleasant. Um and I can't get a clear response from them. I can't get a clear answer from them, which says, we have done the survey. We need X number of millions of pounds to fix the school estate. And it seems to me if all they need is 2 million or 8 million in the capital bids, we've got off very lightly, if that's, if that's what they've done. 
the two million pounds will provide initial funding for steel two monitors and ventilation equipment where required. I don't expect that EA would be able to or have the resource to go out and visit every school in the time frame and say this school needs that. It's really demand led. Schools who think they have a problem will contact the EA maintenance and they will go then and, and assess that school's needs and provide them the equipment that they can. And nobody can say that two million pounds will be sufficient or too much or too little at this point and we'll keep the amount of money under review. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm taking your answer as, as read, but it's probably not what EA said to us and maybe we can take that up with the EA chair at a later stage. Okay. Thanks, Diane. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA, on any capital questions or move to Strew? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, folks, obviously the, the hiking construction costs, how are they impacting on construction, ongoing construction of new schools, um, which is hugely positive. You know, there's one in my own constituency here, St. Joseph's Crossing Den, which you know the people are very excited about. Um, what's what's the impact of the, the hiking construction costs on current bills and on potential future bills? Um, the executive has put, has, has agreed a, a a process to assist those contractors who are currently in contract and couldn't have taken account of increased prices. So there is a process in place that where they can get some additional monies for costs that they they couldn't have allowed for. Uh, in terms of future contracts, we expect that contractors will take account of current market conditions when, when they are actually submitting their tenders. And the current position is yes, all those tenders are probably somewhat higher than we would have expected, but mark, it is the market conditions and it's not going to delay or we're not anticipating that it's going to delay or hold up any projects which are ongoing. Okay, that's that's positive. Um, and do you feel that it has potential to impact future projects because of the pot, because the money is all coming out of the same pot ultimately, how, how would that potentially delay future projects? Well, obviously, if the capital pot has to be stressed a bit further, then we'll be able to release less projects going forward. But we'll just have to manage that in here, depending on how prices go. We are told that prices are going to level out in, in the early part of next year. So we will probably come down a bit again, but not to pre-COVID Brexit levels. Okay, Seamus, so you're confident, Seamus, that the current uh, construction projects as are ongoing will not be delayed as a consequence of the construction hikes um, because of the provision made by the executive um, on that uh, on, on tenders and contracts already in place? Yeah, I'm as confident as I can be that none of those projects will be delayed other than the one that we already know about, St. Rowland. Yes, Rose and Lurgan, which uh, has, that, has that been resolved, Seamus, or where, where is that uh, We we'll need a re-procure, so it's going to be delayed by six to nine months, and hopefully in the re-procurement, with bidders knowing the current market conditions will mean that the procurement goes ahead as planned. Why, why in specific has that impacted St. Rowland's in such a way, Seamus, you know, a school with such ambitions, a school with such a vision for the future, which is incredibly positive. Why is there a delay there, specifically? Um, as far as I understand it, the contractors made bids, prices increased drastically in the period where after they had made the bids and, and we could offer the contract for award, those bids were put in and assessed and, and to such an extent that the contractors could not stand over the prices that they had originally bid. And it was complicated as well in the fact that the pan notice sort of somewhat changed playing field partway through the process when it was issued. So the only course of action was actually to terminate that procurement process and, and re-procure where everybody's back on a level playing field. And that, at the best, would you say, Seamus, that's going to result in a six to nine month uh, delay in the construction? Yeah. Um, is all, are all efforts being made to ensure that that process is accelerated as much as possible within the, the guidelines that are laid out in contract law? 
Yes, the department has taken whatever steps it can to make sure that process is expedited. Okay, Seamus, thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Justin. Okay, Gary, if we could move to the STRU Shared Education Campus uh, briefing and then we'll take some short questions as well. Thank you. Um, thank you to the committee for inviting the department here today to update you on the STRUL programme and the ministerial direction. Firstly, I would like to reaffirm that the department is fully committed to delivering this educationally and strategically significant programme and we're working to move to the next stage as soon as possible. The committee will be aware of the background to the ministerial direction and the current position on the STRUL programme from the briefing paper provided in advance of this session and previous correspondence on this issue in November last year. In summary, in the consideration of the latest business case completed in 2019, given the absence of a comparable benchmark, Permanent Secretary of the Department at that time stated that he was unable to provide the latest second addendum to the programme outline business case on a purely value for money basis. This required the former Minister to consider issuing a ministerial direction. Following consideration of the issues raised in relation to the business case, executive endorsement of the proposal to issue a ministerial direction, confirmation of the Fresh Start funding, progress on the development of the work required to realise the benefits, and reconfirmation of the Memorandum of Agreement, the Minister issued a ministerial direction on the 7th of July this year to move to the next stage. The Department is now working towards a fresh procurement competition with the release of the invitation to tender scheduled for later in the autumn, and we're happy to take any questions you may have. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Uh, keen to bring members in on this issue. So, ju just to be clear, in 2019, the Department for Education Permanent Secretary concluded that progressing with the STRU Shared Education Campus was not value for money? It was, it was a case that because this was the first campus of its kind, of the scale, that there was no comparable benchmark, so we couldn't demonstrate value for money. It's not to say that it isn't value for money, but for business case purposes, we weren't able to demonstrate it. Okay, and that required an education minister ministerial direction to proceed? Yes, because the only comparator we have were five standalone schools, and obviously there, there are different um, elements involved with a shared campus as opposed to five standalone schools. So yes, the ministerial direction was deemed to be the appropriate route. Okay, and what what is the projected total uh, cost of SHRU education campus at this stage? So at this stage, at the end of September 2021, there was £46 million pound had been invested in the programme, and it's estimated that there's a further £184 million required from October 2021 to completion. Okay, so £230 million in total, is that? Yeah, that's £230 million for DE costs, but when you take into account the DFI fees for some of the contractors' work in relation to the road works in relation to Strill, and also schools' own contributions for oratories in two of the schools, the total cost is £232 million. Okay, so, the, and there's five schools on the site? Five, there's one school already on the site, Arbally Special School, and there'll be five post-primary then built as part of the next phase. So there'll be six schools in total? Yeah. Okay, so that's approximately £40 million pounds per school? No. Well, well, there's there's more to it than that. There's obviously uh, additional costs associated with just the fact that it was an ex-military site, the costs that were involved in making the, the remediation works. But Jennifer, who is the construction director, might be able to give a yeah. better insight into the costs in terms of construction. Uh, Chris, there would be nine buildings on the Shard campus, so it's it's not simply just to look at it as you know six schools. Plus there's, you know, in terms of the 46 we've already spent, we've, we've completed a road project, built our valet, two demolition contracts, and a very complicated site preparation works. So it's, it shouldn't really be looked at as just six schools, you know, financially in terms of me. Okay. Um, what, what, can you give me an idea of the, the normal cost to construct a school with associated buildings? A normal school, and look, Seamus is here, and he would know the standalone school better than I would, but our actual core schools, as we call it, are normal school costs in Strew. So, 
you would be talking in the order of about 15 million, you know, for a large post primary, or Seamus, you know, 15 to 20 million would be. You're probably talking much more than that, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Closer to 30 million. Yeah, from the executive paper that went up last year, the average cost per post primary pupil was approximately 31,000 per pupil for a typical post primary. Okay, so just to, is it is it possible to give us a indicative figure of what it costs the Department of Education to build a school? For a school in general, or the yeah, yeah, just just in general, yeah. It, 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 it depends on the on the size of the school on the site. I, I can provide you after the meeting maybe a list of sample projects, how many pupils okay. they are, and how much they cost. Okay, I'm, I'm sure you can give me an an average. Yeah, uh, on average, a decent sized post primary thirty million pound plus. Okay. Okay, thank you. Can you bring other members in? Can I bring in Pat Chain, MLA, please? Thank you, sir. And, and just following on from that, I mean, as you said yourself, Seamus, there are schools of different sizes. I mean, some post primaries uh, would only have maybe six to 700 uh, students, whereas others, uh, I know St. Louise's in my own constituency has 1,500. Uh, students. Uh, so there would obviously be a wide variation in terms of the costs there. Yeah. So w when you're given a sort of ballpark figure of an average, what are you talking about? Uh, that 30 million would be probably based on a school size of around 700. Right, okay. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Okay, and tell me, is there any estimated date or indicative date for the completion of this project? Yes, the target date for completion would be September, in the order of like September 25. September 25, so another four years anyway. Yes. Now, we, we, we've seen recently uh, spiraling costs of building materials, and obviously the longer the delay, the greater the cost. So has that been factored into the financial estimates for this project? It has. So um, we have estimated for future price inflation and also for the contract, the main works contract that we're talking about targeting the release in autumn has what we call an X1 clause, a special clause for us to retain the inflationary risk. Uh, and that has been included in our contract strategy for Stru. So all, all the possible inflationary pressures have been factored into that, I think, 184 million, you said, to complete yes. the project? Yes. Okay, so uh, if, if the project goes ahead as planned, you wouldn't expect it to cost any more than that 184 million? Well, it's, it's a, look at Till we go through the procurement exercise, I mean, obviously we have a huge tender to do. Uh, we can't absolutely categorically state that at this stage, I would say. Well, I, I understand that. I mean, I, I understand that there, there may be some things that are unforeseen or you can't predict. But by, by and large, you've said you've factored in all the potential inflationary pressures into that 184 million. So, I mean, how close do you expect to finish at that particular figure? Well, obviously, at the minute, that is our best estimate. It's the yeah. best way I would describe it. We keep the cost constantly under review, but as Jennifer said, we couldn't actually be more specific until the tenders come in and they are assessed because that will give us a, an idea of the, the real market prices at that time. And okay. from that point on, but they'll, yes. be, they'll be tied down from that point on. There'll be more confidence over them at that point. And also... Um, the the inflation is an indice that we're working off at the minute, and obviously inflation indices can change, but that's, you know, those are the factors. Okay. And, and when do you expect tenders to go out? It is our, what we're working towards at the minute is for tender to be released in, within this month. That is our target at the minute, but it is dependent on a ministerial decision. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Thank you, Chris. Bye. Thanks, Pat. Robin Newton, MLA. 
Thank you, Chair. And uh, I, I have to say, I, I do not envy the team that are delivering uh, this. Um, I think it is a it's a huge uh, challenge in today's circumstances. Um, but indeed, uh, I, I suppose we have never uh, done this before. It's, uh, I suppose it's not too far away from describing it as a visionary step forward in, in, in education. Um, and it's as close to uh, achieving the shared education objectives uh, within Northern Ireland to be, if it's completed or when it's completed, it will be, uh, I think, a fine example. But in delivering it onto the uh, current situation and value for money, um, I, I, I empathise with, with with the team that are working on it. Can I maybe a, just a, a fairly simple question? It's in the it's in the remit of, of the Department of Education at the moment, but indeed this is uh, coming out of the executive strategy. So how how is the education uh, department and, and the executive sharing the the development responsibilities of of this project? Take that from the instruction side. Yeah. From sorry, I thought it was the uh, income sorry, uh, I'm not sure if the question there. Um, is is the it I mean, this 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 is a strategy coming out of the executive shared education, and and indeed uh, the project was conceived. Uh, I think it was an OFM DFM when it was was named that, um, and is is, is it your responsibility to report back to the executive on the project or is it wholly a department of education project well do you want me to pick up well, yeah. I, I mean essentially this as you say it, it has required executive endorsement support uh, it, it emanated from the executive's policy and shared education the taking forward of the program is entirely entirely rests with the department um and then if there was any well, I would imagine our colleagues can maybe comment better that updates would be provided to the executive at regular intervals, but the responsibility for taking the whole thing forward rests with the department. And obviously, if there were any significant changes, those would have to be drawn to the executive's attention again at a later stage or at an appropriate juncture. Yeah, that's correct. Because the, it had an executive endorsement for the ministerial direction, the intention is that there will be updates provided. And as Gary said, if there's any... Um, predicted estimated significant estimated rises in costs obviously the executive would have to be notified of that as well and it is likely that there are going to be significant estimated uh, increases in costs isn't it well no the hope is that it wouldn't be but as i say we keep the cost constantly under review and until the, the tender prices are in then that would be when we would have more confidence over the figures Okay, so re really, it's 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 a reporting back situation, um, not a sharing of responsibility. No, the it, right. it's, the department is responsible for the delivery of the the campus. Yeah. O okay. okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chair. This certainly is an interesting discussion and goes right to the heart of my constituency. There's a, quite a number of schools that have been hanging on for some years and buildings that are no longer fit for purpose uh, that need upgraded and maintained uh, the longer this goes on. And children, uh, unfortunately, an entire generation has lost out on a promise that was made uh, that has been broken time and time again. And obviously there's a series of issues for that, the collapse of the institutions because the minister the minister was required to sign off the project, was delayed by three years, and also procurement difficulties. So I want to focus on the procurement difficulties of this project because I struggle to uh, understand how any one contractor will be appetised by what's on the table here and that uh, the risk is so significant and so great. I know that previous contractors that pulled out of the procurement process um, shared their concerns with you in relation to the risk that was involved by any one contractor taking on such a substantial project. Uh, so with that said, has there been any lessons learned in terms of the procurement uh, process? Uh, and do you feel that given the climate that we're in, 
uh, and given the risks involved in such in taking in one contractor or two contractors taking on such a project, do, 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 do you think you're going to struggle to secure uh, a, 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 a contractor to do this? Uh, I'll take that obviously. Thank you, Daniel. By the way, I should comment that I, I liked your enthusiasm trying to ask a question about Strull several times, so thank you very much. Uh, just to say from the outset, look, the previous competition where there was two bidders and one withdrew, what they cited at the time was political instability, not the contract itself. I just want to just really clarify that, because at that time the executive weren't sitting, and when a contractor has to tender for the scale of a project of Strull, and just to remind everybody, the main works is in the order of 120 million. It takes a lot of money and investment to tender for the scale of that project. So when they go into that commitment, they want to be sure that the tender is going to go ahead. So just to address that point originally, yes, there has been lessons learned. And what we've done since ministerial direction in August, we did face-to-face -face meetings with uh, industry as well as CEF and spoke about our contract strategy, what the offer was, and then asked for a commitment to bid. And I'm glad to say that was a positive experience and we have had a very significant amount of companies committing to bid when we released the tender. Now we have also looked at our risk profile and I mentioned the inflation clause. We have also looked at, we did more works in the site preparation works to, re, to again reduce risk for the main works contract. So. When I say lessons learned, we have actively, even in the delay period, worked to make it a more attractive offer. So um, hopefully that gives you the confidence that you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, you, you've just reminded me actually that the, the real the reason what, what, for, for, for that contract was, that, uh, in fact, the absence of the institutions because it required uh, ministerial sign off and there was other projects that, uh, that, that were at risk at the time uh, and that led to it, I suppose, because of the cost of the, of the tending process. So th thanks for reminded me of that. Uh, ju just in relation to the site in itself, obviously it's vitally important for my constituency and constituents and also the, 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 the uh, schools that are, are, are uh, in limbo at present. Uh, and I, I am excited by the date of, uh, of 2025, I think was said, and I hope that we can uh, stick to that uh, without any hurdles. But w w what work has been undertaken at the Struel campus over the past year? Um, in terms of development, or even since the direction by the Minister? Well, over the last year, I mean, we completed, last November, we completed the site preparation works, and given that you've been around the site, Daniel, you probably, you, you remember, obviously, the very substantial. Uh, currently, there's a huge stone capital there across the site, which genuinely means that when we have the main works contract, they can come in and start building straight away. So just to, to mention that. Just to say that over the last year after that, without ministerial direction, we, we, weren't, we had no authority to do any active construction. So in that way, we have not been actively constructing, I suppose, in the Stroud campus. But we've been working other elements of the contract, if you want to mention that, Sinead. Obviously, other parts of the programme have been working the whole time. We have never stopped. But in pure construction terms, we had no authority to spend without ministerial direction. Yes, there's been a lot of work ongoing between the schools just in terms of developing pilot projects that they'll carry out in the run-up to the, the move to the campus to increase and embed sharing across the schools and also to look at the, how we will ensure delivery of the educational benefits once the schools move on to the campus. And then there's obviously other work going on and other work streams in relation to uh, vacated sites and what will happen to school sites whenever they move away from their current locations and also in terms of the governance and management of the funding of the new campus whenever it's operational. So that's okay. all been ongoing during that three-year period. Okay, uh, thank you for that. What priority has the department allocated uh, to the Struel campus? It's one of the highest priority programmes within the, the department. It's uh, the flagship programme for shared education. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Uh, and how may the work on the Struel campus be affected by other funding pressures that was outlined earlier by, by Gary? The Struel campus is funded almost entirely from the Fresh Start Agreement budget. So we have got an agreement from the Treasury in relation to the flexibility 
and the release of the Fresh Start funding for Strill until the end of the Fresh Start period in 25, 26. Okay, uh, and given what's happened in other projects, how may I know Pat slightly touched on this, how may future work on the Strill campus be affected by the shortages and massive increases in the cost of building materials? Uh, well, obviously, we're about to enter a tender period, and we've had a really healthy conversation with industry, as I said, in August, and our tender strategy was slightly altered after that engagement, I should say. But in terms of financial, we have increased the capital budget of Strill to take account of where we see the building uh, increases have came to at the minute. But obviously, we're in a very you know, strange time, really, in terms of tendering. And if there is any issues in our tender return, it will be picked up at full business case stage after tender return. Yeah, I entirely appreciate this is not straightforward. And, and uh, it's been met with delays way beyond the control of, of, of yourself. So I do appreciate that. And just a final question, Chair. How does the department envisage the three-year budget allocation will help? Do you believe it will help uh, with this project? Or is it the case that it's simply money coming out of a fresh start so it really doesn't affect anything in that regard? I don't, I don't think it would really affect no. in any way because of the fact that we are funded almost entirely from fresh start unless Gary or... Seamus is aware. No, I think the critical the critical thing was getting uh, some assurance around the fresh start funding, which we've already received. So that, that really was the key thing for this particular program. And Gary, just just on that point, is two. It's estimated that the cost, which has risen to two hundred thirty million, which is entirely explainable given delays and also the rising cost of materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But does that figure include the necessary infrastructure that will need to be put in place? to link to the schools um, uh, around Oma. Uh, you know, there are concerns about the main road uh, to the school. Uh, I'll take that up. The, the, as you're aware, Daniel, we have the, we've already completed Strathroy Link Road. Yeah, and great, great. We have in planning uh, Gorchin Road and Mountjoy Road extension. Yeah. So we are, we've resubmitted to the Fermanagh and Oma District Council and we're Hopeful for you know a positive uh, return on that soon, really. So, look as far as we're concerned, you know, Stroll, and again, it's why our campus looks artificially high at times because we've had to do much more uh, roadworks than would be expected in, in a one school development. So there's yeah. quite substantial external works to Stroll, and yeah. you know that's been a response to listening to the community and very significant. Uh, traffic analysis of OMA and obviously around the campus. So that's yeah. and obviously in the long term, the A5 will help decongest OMA from its current issues. And it, it is a town that uh, is facing considerable issues in terms of congestion. But hopefully, when the A5 is delivered, that'll take the pressure off. Just a very, it's a yes or no question. This on the on the wider note, will the three year budget, which which I did touch on, uh, potentially help other major building projects? I know it's slightly off strudel issue, but it, it is coming up. Shame. Yes, uh, it'll allow the department to plan better going forward. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're very pro that. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Diane Dodds, MLA. Sorry, just a very quick question. Um, go, going back to the idea of the ministerial direction, if I recall correctly, the ministerial direction was taken to the executive and approved by every party on the executive. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes, that the, all of the executive members approved the, or endorsed the decision by the minister to issue a ministerial direction. Okay, that's all right. I should say the intention because it was the, that was Minister Weir, so it was uh, obviously Minister Michael Bean that issued the ministerial direction. Yeah, but I, I just want to be clear that um, in terms of the ministerial direction and the issue over value for money, because I know that ministerial directions are required where they can't prove value for money yet, is the important issue, um, that um, it was approved by every party in the executive with all of the information available. Yes, that's the understanding. Yes, yeah, full executive approval. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, not entirely sure the executive has the the capacity to quote unquote approve a ministerial direction. Right, endorsement. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, Jennifer, I think it was you said you were speaking to industry in relation to the hiking construction costs, particularly in relation to materials, but it's not just in relation to materials, in relation to labour as well. Um, who have you spoken to in industry? Uh, unfortunately, I can't disclose that uh, level of detail at this time. It was a, it's part of a procurement process, so I can't, I can't go into company names. But what we did is we released a notice, it's called a prior information notice, to warm up in industry and invite them to come and talk to us. And in that, we provided a very detailed project brief and an overview of Strull. And even with COVID, and it was up to the individual companies, we did face-to-face -face meetings uh, in Clare House uh, with a range of companies. And look, all I am glad to say is that was very frank conversations, very positive, and it returned with you know a very significant amount of bidders want to bid for Strull. And that's a mixture between individual companies and what we call JVs, joint ventures, so a range of companies coming together. So it was... But I, unfortunately, I can't name the actual companies. Okay. Have you spoken to the Institute for Civil Engineers? No. Well, at that time, we invited uh, CEF, sorry, Construction Employers Federation in yeah. as well. And again, we had a very uh, you know, enthusiastic debate on, obviously, Strull and where we were at that time. So, it, as I said, it helped refine our tender, which is ready to go as, we, as we're sitting here. Okay. And what the lessons learned from Strull and the... Uh, blockages that we met and the pitfalls that we met along the way, um, how will they be applied or you know, going forward? How will those lessons be adopted going forward? I suppose uh, really in terms of procurement, what we've done is we have shortened the procurement as much as we can to make it more efficient uh, in terms of we've actually gone from a restricted procurement to an open procurement because of the scale is true and there'll be a minimum standards for our you know, industry to meet. But we've also looked at, we as a client, what risk is appropriate for us to retain and what is appropriate for industry to, to retain. So, I mean, not wanting to get too into the detail of contract particulars, but really what we've moved from a lump sum contract that went out previously in 2018 to a target cost contract, which uh, means that it shares more of the risk uh, you know, of the financials with the industry rather than it being a lump sum from day one. And obviously we have the what I call the inflationary clause in the contract, which again was very welcomed by the industry. We've also retained ground risk. And as I've mentioned, we have spent uh, you know, a very long time, almost three years, uh, doing the site preparation works of Strull, which has actually went into you know, the infrastructure of Strull. And you know, obviously it coming from an ex-military site, I think it's important to highlight that it was you know, 140 acres and it was in military ownership from late 1800. So there was a lot of contamination issues for us to deal with. And we dealt with that in a smaller contract. So uh, just to say, it's more to do with risk share and making sure that you understand what is appropriate as a client to hold on to and what is appropriate in risk share terms with your contractors. And what, what, is, what is appropriate for the contractor to hold on to in terms of risk? Well, really, it's in terms of performance and in terms of delivery and, you know, in terms of bringing their supply chain into the room. So, it, I mean, to be honest, in that conversation with our industry, there was no issue raised that changed our contract strategy in that way. So it was, it was a positive endorsement from the industry in the changes we've made. And does the department now retain the majority of risk based on hiking costs of materials or, or on labour? And um, when... Ordinarily, that should be potentially foreseen within the contracts and the tender. We're holding inflationary risk as part of Strull, but to be honest, for a scale of our project, uh, and being over two years, that's best practice for any project, even before COVID and even before this, uh, you know, obviously inflationary, I suppose, fluctuations have happened. So it's best practice anyway, what we're doing. And let's say a contractor gets the, the very the, the quantities wrong. And does that then go back on the department? No, that would be retained by the contractor, but that would be uh, appropriate and normal risk for them to retain. Okay. All right, here. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. No problem. Thank, thanks, Justin. Folks, I'm conscious that political decisions have driven the scale of the task that you face. But um, having said that, I, I, I think it's objective fact to say that the the project is 
significantly over budget, significantly over time, um, and um, has required ministerial direction to overrule an experienced Department of Education and Permanent Secretary. Um, so what what is the justification for that? The ministerial direction was issued on the, well, was based on the fact that the minister identified that the the need or the, the public need was uh, demonstrated in terms of the educational, the economic and community benefits that would be delivered as part of the programme. So that was why the, the decision was made to proceed with the ministerial direction and to seek the executive endorsement to proceed with the programme. Okay, and does it have anything to do with the fact that it's a shared education campus? Well, yes, that's where the, the educational benefits are coming from, the educational benefits of shared education. And what, what will the nature and extent of sharing at the campus be? That is still being, it's been identified as part of the benefits realisation plan, so we're working through now with the schools in terms of what that will look like in reality. So that's part of the work that's ongoing at the minute, that's one of the pieces of work that's required before the decision is made to release the, the tender. So that's, it's, it's got a lot of impetus at the minute and the schools are all very heavily involved with that, coming up with some very good ideas for pilot projects to take forward in the run up to the opening of the campus and then what will be delivered on the campus. Okay, if we're expended 230 million pounds of money from a department that's in financial crisis, should we not already be clear as to the unique what the unique benefits in terms of sharing are going to be at the site? We, we have identified them at the higher level but this is just going into more granularity about what it will look like and operationally to ensure that uh, there will be no issues in terms of delivery. Okay and if you were building six schools again would you do it in this way? This wouldn't be a decision for us. <laughs> Worth a try. Um, yeah, look, I think everybody realizes the the money and time that has already been invested into this project and the significance of it to children and families in in that area, um, and and that that is ultimately the most important part of the delivery of the project, um, but. I, I think it's entirely reasonable to acknowledge there have been major, major difficulties uh, with this project. But uh, as, I, as I acknowledged to start with there, political decisions have, have driven those challenges and I, I acknowledge the, uh, the hard work that you guys are doing to, to try and overcome those challenges and, and thank you for it. Gary, thank, thank you for, to you and your team for, for the briefing today. In closing, can I ask you a straightforward question? Um, what What is the current financial health of the Department of Education? Well, I suppose as, as outlined in the paper, there are still unmet at, at this stage of the year what we deem to be unmet needs um, that we will continue to bid for, reassess and bid for later in the year. Does education remain in financial crisis? Well, subject to these inescapable pressures being met, uh, there, yeah, it is, it's still significant concern to me that these inescapable pressures haven't been met yet at this point in the year. Okay, well, look, we hope to stay in close contact with you around a number of those key issues. And um, as you said, you've identified January monitoring as potentially another significant stage mm -hmm. in your financial. Uh, situation this this year uh, and I'm sure we'll we'll be engaging with you around that as well then so thank you okay no problem thank you thank you thank, thank you. you thanks folks all the best okay can I ask assembly broadcasting to remove witnesses and to add members back into the spotlight and keep them there until the end of this session Clark do you wish to summarize any actions or requests for information resulting from the briefing uh, certainly, Chair, um, <clears throat> that, that was quite a uh, comprehensive um, question and answer session. Um, 
you asked uh, that the team to prepare a paper for the committee um, about the fact that the education of um, Northern Ireland pupils per head is less well funded. Um, so, can I ask Sorry, Clark, they cut across you. Uh, do members wish to mute their devices um, unless and until they're speaking? Some very positive uh, family child esque noises there, I think, but um, they're just, uh, we, we're struggling to hear you, Amy. Uh, I could listen to those noises all day, but we'll get, we'll get business done first. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. True. Um, okay, so just, yeah, that's the paper that you asked for, first of all. Um, and that's to reference uh, the amount per head that's being spent on each child um, on their education in Northern Ireland. Um, and your question really was, you know, can this be about how we spend money as opposed to how much money have we to spend? Then um, uh, Justin wanted some more information about why the Being Well, Doing Well pilot had been held back. Um, and yeah, there was some discussion about how much is it does a does a school cost? So although uh, Seamus came up with thirty million pounds, um, you know ballpark, he said that he would send us some uh, models of you know what variety there might be in and around that. Um, and really, the only other action then is to um, schedule a briefing with the team again um, in December, um, so that we can keep up to date with their monitoring and um, you know how they're coming along with these. Uh, these bids. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone have anything else? Are to agree those actions or any other points there is? I, I just have, uh, you know, when I, when I hear dates, particularly around this project, it's hard to get uh, excited about it because, you know, there's still the tender process and everything else, and, you know, the challenges facing contractors and, and so on and so forth. I just feel that this tender probably should have been broken down to be a much more manageable, chunk-sized approach, uh, and it probably would have de delivered this this entire project much more quickly than has happened. Obviously, there's some elements that is beyond the control of the Department of Education, and obviously the collapse of the institution has been one, but uh, it's been going on a lot longer than the three-year absence of the institutions. Um and I just think that a different approach by the Department for Education in terms of how this procurement process is ruled out would ensure the delivery of the project on time as opposed to going for one major uh, contractor. And that that's feedback I've had directly from contractors involved in the previous process. Um, you know, I just think that it's just not realistic. Yeah, I, I mean, I similar to yourself, I think Justin raised it as well. I, I received direct feedback stating that the size of the tender um, was an issue for contractors and the scale of the risk for one contractor to take on was uh, was a ch was challenging also. So um, we, we could ask, we can make um, representations about that, but I'm, I'm conscious that the, that the message was that the tender is to be released this month um so yeah. we, may, we may find out rapidly whether or not the confidence in uh the 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 one parcel of contract um being you know being uh met by contractors that is going to materialize or not fairly fairly soon i imagine well i know that feedback i've had from contractors is that to tender for such a project could see costs to the contractor of in excess of a million pounds and which is a very risky situation it is and I, th I think we've we've raised those questions fairly comprehensively with the department today and then they've been very clear that they are confident that this second tender um, will be met with a, a, a positive response. And that indeed it will be released this month, so uh, we we can we could seek further assurances in writing, Daniel. Um, but it's I, I think we gave that a, a fair hearing today, and I think the department's been extremely optimistic um, with um, how that tender process is going to go. I think the task is for us to um, keep an keep alert to how that tender process goes. Um, 
obviously. Chair, I, um, I visited, I'll keep this very brief. I, I visited the site uh, during uh, lockdown and had a tour of it. It is huge. Uh, and you, it's not until you're actually standing in the center of it that you appreciate how major this project is. Um, and it's not until you're standing in the middle of it until you actually appreciate why there's been so many delays as well. Um, so definitely, I just, I wouldn't be overly confident that it could be delivered in the time scale that we've been told or within the cost. And I think that one feeds the other due to how the tendering process is going to be rolled out. And I just don't see how it's going to happen that way. Which, as I, as I say, impacts on the education of children and young people and families, which has to be the, the focus ultimately here. Uh, I think, I think the committee has followed the issue closely, Daniel, and I think I think we'll continue to do that over the next month. But if there are any other specific actions or requests you want us to follow up on, then I'm happy to consider those. Any other? Yeah, there, is a, there is a yeah. there is a brief suggestion that I would make, and it would uh, uh, show that this committee is very much dedicated to ensuring and committed to ensuring this project does go ahead. Obviously, the schools that have been sitting in limbo for quite some time. Uh, have been extremely frustrated because the level of maintenance required of the existing buildings has just not been carried out. And children, young people, teachers and staff have been in buildings that are no longer fit for purpose. I think it would do no harm as a suggestion uh, that this committee write to the schools involved, say that we are probing at this issue uh, and, uh, uh, and also ask them for feedback as to how, I suppose, uh, they have felt that the delays have impacted on children and on their schools. I'd be happy to do that on behalf of the committee. Let, uh, ultimately, this is what the focus needs to be here, delivering fit for purpose education for children and young people in, in facilities that are adequate to do so. Any other members want to come in on that or are content to agree those actions? Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I have to chair the audit committee in in fifteen minutes, so I, I'll be I, slipping yeah, on. I think we're almost finished as well, uh, Daniel. But uh, on that note, happy enough then, Clark. We'll move to agenda item eight, which is our update in relation to the committee stage of the integrated education bill. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the committee, Clark, on page one four four, and a research paper on the integrated education bill at page one four six. Uh, the briefing and research paper note particular issues that have been highlighted to us uh, during the committee stage of the bill. Evidence has now been taken from the bill's sponsor, the department and a range of stakeholders, and we anticipate that the sponsor and the department will advise of, us of any proposed amendments soon. Members may wish to note that additional data is being sought for Section 7 of the research paper, the researcher will present this paper at next week's meeting and the examiner for statutory rules will also present to the education committee next week. Clark, do you want to speak to any particular matters that are being provided in those updates? Yes, Chair, I would um, invite members to familiarise themselves with the research paper. It is very comprehensive and it describes a lot of the um, the oral evidence um, and issues that have been raised to date um, and I think sets them out, you know, clearly um, and accessibly. Um, I have written to the sponsor of the bill about um, particular areas in which uh, she, she may want to, to make amendments, to propose amendments, and I've asked that um, she'll get in touch with us um, in, in in the next week or so about that so that the committee can begin to think about whether you know it wants to make amendments similarly i've asked the department um to provide the text of any amendments and some answers to to questions um as soon as possible um so that we can get across that members will recall that um in clause one there were some concerns uh about the definition of integrated education um it didn't uh, uh, restate the definition constituted by the 1989 order. Um, it isn't. It isn't changing um, the definition in the 1989 order, but presentationally that caused some confusion. Um, clause three um, required the department to to consult NICE um, uh, 
on a lot of matters and the department was concerned that that was too too much um, and that that would constitute promotion of one sector over another. So again, both the uh, bill sponsor and the department will come back to us um, about that. In respect of area planning, um, the duty to promote extends to the current um, planning authorities, um, CCMS and the Education Authority. Um, and members had a lot of questions about about those duties. Um, and, and I think maybe the bill sponsor can give some clarification um, as to as to how those proposals um, finalised in the way that they did. Um, clause six, um, concern was raised that the requirements of clause six were in conflict with uh, CCMS's statutory responsibilities to the Catholic maintained sector. But again, that's in the context of CCMS being um, a planning authority alongside the uh, education authority um, and, and, a, and a function of the, the fact that the other sectors are not represented um, to the same extent in, in the final planning authority decision. Uh, clause seven, um, there were some concerns that it didn't take into consideration the legal development proposal process um, that's currently uh, in place for the establishment of a new school. Um, queries were raised as to whether the clause extended only to new schools or whether amalgamations also fell within um, its scope. And the bill sponsor clarified in evidence that reference to a new school in this clause is a brand new build. Um, then in clauses, uh, sorry, also in clause seven, um, there was a lot of discussion about the idea that there should be an assumption that a new school would be integrated. Um, the sponsor did um, uh, take pains to explain that this should be based on um, community consultation um, and the community conversation toolkit, which we referenced earlier, and um, which future schools are going to come and present about um, to the committee, um, is one way that's already being used to try to gauge locally um, what the needs of an area and a community are um, and what's, what their preference is um, for school. And that, that works um, together with the area planning process. Um, on clauses 10 and 11, um, which relate to the regulation making powers of the bill and also the level of assembly control that those regulations would be subject to. Um, the examiner for statutory rules will advise on those next week um, and deal with any uh, concerns that arose. Um, and legal advice has also been sought on some of these issues um, and also just on the terminology of the bill just to, um, you know, I suppose reassure stakeholders that the terminology that is being used is drafting parlance for, for instance, um, the creation of a duty on a public body um, and that kind of thing. Um, so members, I'm sure that, you know, you're having a look at these these clauses, um, at, you know, at party level and individually as well and engaging with the department and, and the sponsor. Um, but at committee level, that's just to give you an update on on where where the engagement um, ha has has arrived at. Thanks for that update, Clark. Members, any questions? Are happy to review those papers in advance of next Wednesday. Um, Chair, could I come in? Uh, yes, yeah, oh, sorry. Go forget I had the video turned off. Um, not that that matters really, to be honest. Um, you see, in advance of reviewing the papers, is it possible to get legal services to give us um, their overview of the bill and any issues they're in? I mean, just so that we have a complete picture of um, the all of the issues around the bill. I think that would be, you know, complete our, our knowledge of, of the issues. Clark, you mentioned that legal advice had been requested, yeah? Yeah, legal advice has been requested um, and it is, I suppose, um, it has been requested on the generality um, of the bill as well as specific issues that have been raised 
Um, so hopefully that will be comprehensive and, and assist you, uh, Diane. Could, could could we get the legal advice, though, on a clause by clause basis? Because, you know, we're looking at it, I mean, I'm not any legal expert, and we're looking at it um, through layman's eyes, really, without having that kind of expertise behind us as well, just so that we know. I mean, I'm still not clear. I have read um, the the paper, particularly on the Clause 7 issue, which um, has, has caused a lot of uh, concern. And I'm not clear from that paper that that takes me any further forward on that particular issue than what I already knew. So, I mean, it's, it's just so that we understand completely um, all of the issues around the bill. Yeah. From, from that legal perspective, so that we're, we're we've just got a complete picture. Sure, thank you, thank you. Well, do. Okay, members, have any other questions or comments? No. Okay. I, uh, Chair, I would agree with uh, Diane's uh, request. There, I think that is the most appropriate way forward in relation to it. So, uh, I think it's a good suggestion. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Clark. Um, so we'll return to that next week then. Um, agenda item nine, members, any other business? No? Nope. Okay, then agenda item 10, a date and time of our next meeting. Our next formal committee meeting is tomorrow, Thursday, the 4th of November, via Starleaf at 9 a.m. I put the question that the committee meeting does now adjourn. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Thanks, members. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.